lot of things in all fields of the research it may be engineering medicine or science or nano technology whatever it may be this combination is very useful why i am saying these two if you have the knowledge in the these two things you can achieve more things you can shine well in the research because or uh, one year back google the sundar pichai the chief executive officer of the google suggested that suggested and the uh, he advised the scientist that he suggested we have achieved lot of things using the computer in many different fields i think i i i also thought that when he delivering his lecture on the online conference he suggested that we can observe the flower smell through the internet of things or internet through the network through the computer i thought how is it possible but it is possible it is possible he told that within 10 years we can achieve to smell the observe the smell of the flower through the computer it is possible why i am saying that the computer the chemical the researchers in the chemistry and the chemical engineering can also achieve because the chemical chem researchers in chemistry also using the, the smells and the, the per, per, perfumes like that if you use that concept in chemical chemical engineering chemistry we can achieve more things we can shine and also we can uh, it, the applications of this concept may be very useful in day to day activities or day to day life applications so there are so many applications can be adopted in the field of chemistry physics and the using the computer and the statistics this is a very good effort at this context during the covid 19 pandemic so i am very appreciating and congratulates the conference convener and the co conveners and the head of the departments and our dean faculty of science for constant encouraging the constantly encouraging the the conference team members and also i extend my thanks for the dean head of the department and the team members of the conference and the ipsc director and the ipsc team members of anamalai university for given this opportunity to deliver my inaugural lecture thank you very much congratulations once again thank you very much for all of you thank you sir now i invite dr v ramaswamy dean faculty of science to give his special address and release the e book of abstract respected professor dr k sitaraman registrar anamali university dr vijendra mehta instrument scientist from australia professor yes godenayegi head of the department of chemistry annamalai university dr susmita das convener of this seminar co conveners coordinators organizing secretaries technical committee members guests speakers participants colleagues 
teaching and non-teaching members of the Department of Chemistry. Good morning to all. So really, I am very happy to join with you on the occasion of this uh, Virtual International Conference on Surface Chemistry 2022. First of all, I would like to welcome with pleasure all of you for this international conference. Then I would like to thank each one of you for joining this today International Conference on Surface Chemistry 2022. Sir, I feel very proud to say that this conference has been organized by the Department of Chemistry. The department organizes such conferences because of to enlighten the young minds and promote the participation of students at all levels. Really, it is wonder. So in this conference, I heard from the convener, there are more than 400 registered as delegates for this conference. 146 abstracts were received. And also I'm very happy to inform. So from 18 states of this country, The delegates are attending this conference and also from four countries apart from India, it is abroad, the delegates are attending, which shows a very good response in this conference, which means the importance of this uh, surface chemistry in the, for, for solving the current problem in the respective area. Sir, I bid a warm welcome to all the renowned speakers and delegates who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this conference. Really, we are honored to have you all with us. So on behalf of Anomaly University, I offer my regards to all scientists, research scholars, and the people joining us. So I convey my best regards to the keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Jijendra Mata. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and coming over for this conference. I think the schedule of this seminar will focus on the topic of surface chemistry. It will include more issues to address the full aspects of the topic. So being myself is from the physics discipline, I know a little bit about the surface chemistry, but any of the surface chemistry plays an important role in our day-to-day -day activities. It finds many applications in the field of uh, detergents, solubilization of hydrophobic drugs, cleaning agents, cosmetics, then catalysis, lubrication, adhesion, adsorption, and also to get the a better fertilizers for farmers and to reduce the pollutants from automobile emissions. So such a wide application is in the surface chemistry. So this will help us to understand how the reactions on the surfaces of uh, microscopic ice crystals in the stratosphere nowadays threaten in the uh, earth to protect the ozone layers. So this surface chemistry is important in many critical chemical processes, such as enzymatic 
reactions at biological interfaces found in cell walls and cell membranes especially in electronics at the surfaces and the interfaces of microchips used in the computers and the heterogeneous catalysts found in the catalytic converter used for cleaning so such a variety of applications are uh, from surface chemistry i think it is most important for the human beings to away from the pollutants to minimize the pollutants so the research of the surface chemistry is very very important it also brings me a fourth potential role for the scientists one that that is less evident from your conference program but that as a public policy professor i wish to urge upon you so already several several scientists have proven their capacity just not to learn and understand the fundamentals of your own discipline but to expand its boundary to discover the things that no one has ever known even by coming to this conference you assert your aptitude to take up and wield this knowledge to marshal and communicate it so as to it has an impact so i think with this i can close my um, special address so such a really i wonder and also i am very happy to give you a talk a little bit uh, about this surface chemistry i congratulate all the team members for taking so much of effort to do this uh, conference i wish the conference enlights us all and provides us with approaches to deal with this problems of tomorrow thank you to everyone who made this conference possible with their opinions and views enjoy for this two days conference thank you thank you onanda please sir sir release the release uh, ebook of abstract okay So really, I am very proud to release this uh, e-book. So is it visible? Yes, sir, visible, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So I congratulate for the success of this conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. now i invite dr s kodinahi head department of chemistry annamala university to felicitate revered registrar of annamala university dr sita raman sir most respected dean faculty of science annamala university dr ramaswami sir our beloved senior professor and convener of this virtual international conference dr sashpita madam co conveners dr sindil kumar and dr vidya shakar eminent speakers all hods all the faculty members dear participants and everyone present here 
a very good our university sir we are honored to have listened to your inaugural speech on the importance of surface chemistry and usage of various softwares related to chemistry on behalf of all gathered here our heartfelt thanks to you sir next up, i i am profusely elated to take an opportunity to thank and appreciate our dean faculty of science anamla university for his gracious presence to join us today in the inaugural function of this international conference who delivered his inspiring special address and released the abstract of the conference thank you sir with great pleasure i congratulate the convener co conveners and other team members for their great enthusiasm and cooperation to make this conference a great success next on behalf of chemistry department i would like to appreciate our eminent speakers from reputed institution all over the world who are going to deliver inspiring lectures on various topics related to surface chemistry and its technological applications and i wish all the participants and hope you will have a chance to enhance your knowledge in attending this virtual international conference thank you thank you ma'am before vote of thanks the keynote address will be delivered at 10 am after the inaugural meeting is over i request dr s sendil kumar to offer the vote of thanks thanks good morning to all on behalf of organizing committee first of all i thanks to university authorities our vice chancellor honorable vice chancellor Professor R M Padreesan sir, for his whole hearted support and his rendered for the conference, and my sincere thanks to our registrar, Professor R M K Sitaraman sir, who has helped his many aspect and also spared a valuable time to grace the occasion. I and extend my sincere sincere thanks to our dean, Faculty of Science. Professor V Ramaswamy sir for continuous support and encouragement, and my special thanks to our head of the department, Professor S Padanagi Mehta, for her continuous support and his guidance and also suggestions given, and my enormous respect to her, sir, madam. I thanks to speakers from India and uh, abroad for spending a valuable time. and also thanks to delegates who are the main strength of the conference and and especially thanks to all the staff members of the chemistry family a regular faculty of engineering and a research scholar non teaching staff and especially i thanks to iekc for providing the facilities and particularly i thank to our jay prakash sir is a deputy director of our ikc for your continuous and constant support for uh, leading the pro conferences in a great manner and finally i thanks to all the research scholars who are given the tireless effort for the conference okay thanks to one and all no now i invite dr jitendra mata keynote address uh, before that i invite dr k krishna sami professor and director tnp uh, introduce the uh, today speaker keynote address speaker sir unmute yourself sir
Yes, sir. A most respected register, sir, Professor K. Sitaraman, sir, and our respected uh, Dean, Professor Ramasamy, sir, and head of, head of the department, Professor Godinayak, madam, and the convener of this conference, Professor, Professor Sashwadas, madam, and other organizing committee members, RSS scholars, and my dear participants. Good morning to all. Really, I am very happy to introduce today's guest, uh, Professor uh, Jitendra Mehta, ECM, a senior instrument scientist for the Cocobra, an ultra small angle neutron scatter instrument from 2017 onwards, and an instrument associate for the Quaka, a small angle neutron, neutron scattering instrument at the Australian Center for Neutron Scattering, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, Australia. Dr. Mata has been at uh, ANSTO, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization for nearly about 13 years, working as an instrument scientist for the Quaka for four years, a research leader at ANSTO Minerals for three years, and as a postdoctoral research fellow at the ACNS for two years. He also worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Australian National University with Professor John White for nearly about three years. Dr. Mother's research concerns regarding with the complex soft materials, and he has had industry relevance since his PhD. He has investigated several areas of soft condensed matter science, such as surfactants and black hole polymer solutions, emulsions, food proteins, hydrogels, and minerals. Dr. Mathas co authored more than 90 peer reviewed research articles and two book chapters, all in high impact journals. He has published several scientific reports. Such a great personality is today with us for uh, participating in this uh, conference on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, on behalf of our university, on behalf of the organizing committee. I welcome you, sir, for this conference and uh, delivering his uh, keynote address. I welcome you, sir, for delivering your keynote address for this conference. Welcome, welcome, welcome you, sir. Please, sir. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Just nod it so I know. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's audible. Okay, that's great. That's great. So it's good to know. And thank, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share what we do here and also to motivate some of you to come here and use our wonderful facility. Uh, so what my plan is today is I'll just give you the overview of our institute and then I'll, I'll go a little bit more deep on uh, what my instruments are and what they are capable of. And then I'll present one example where, where I have chose this example to, because it has both bulk and surface, prop, uh, surface characterization. So I hope you enjoy uh, this talk. So just before I start. I Sir, you. your voice is good. hope you can hear the audio in that video and probably my my audio is a little bit clearer as well uh, sorry about that earlier so uh, the video which you show uh, shows our facility it's an australian nuclear science and technology organization it's an australian government facility and as you can see here uh, it has uh, multiple campus two in sydney and one is in melbourne i work here in the main campus which is in sydney 
uh, it is it has more than one billion dollar uh, investment by Australian government, and it, it has more than two hundred staff. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Your voice is slow, sir. Okay, let me let me fix that. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Or Little is it louder. Crazy? Okay. Okay. Hang on. Just a minute. Just give me a second, and I can fix the audio. Okay. Is it is it better now? It is fine now. Okay. Excellent. Cool. So sorry about that. And can you can you see? Hang on. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So, so what I wanted to show is where this uh, campus is located. So, uh, the nuclear reactor which we have is a very small nuclear reactor. It's called uh, Opal Reactor. We used to have old reactor which are now decommissioned. Uh, this is this is in Sydney. So, Sydney CBD is here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Uh, Sorry, I have to reshare it. Okay. So, so as you can see, it's a nuclear reactor in Sydney. And uh, if you go 800 kilometers south, that's the Melbourne. And there we have Australian synchrotron facility. Now, the whole purpose of our reactor is to produce neutron. We use this neutron for various applications, uh, such as radio pharmaceutical or silicon irradiation and so on. But the application which I generally am involved call uh, neutron scattering experiments. So we have this amazing neutron scattering facility uh, and where we use all the neutrons. So basically what we have, we have this nu small nuclear reactor, um, and uh, then you, we have a various beam lines on this uh, reactor. Uh, I, I look after two instruments. You can see the name Quokka and also the Kukabara. So Kukabara is ultra small angle neutron scattering instrument and Quokka is a small angle neutron scattering instrument. This is the another view of the facility. This is the longest, the, uh, if you see the gray color tube, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but uh, that's a very long instrument. It's a 40 meter long instrument called small angle neutron scattering instrument. And then next to the gray color tube, there is another a small angle neutron scattering instrument, which is called Bilby. So what we have given, uh, each instrument, we have 15 neutron scattering instrument and three X-ray scattering instrument. So we have given every single instrument uh, Australian animal name because they are amazing animals and never uh, they they are not generally not found anywhere else. So whenever you come, whenever you hear me quokka, you know it's a small angle neutron scattering instrument, and if you hear me kukabara, it's a ultra small angle neutron scattering instrument. Don't worry, you don't have to remember now. More more you go through it more actually it get you get used to it so now i don't want I, I will not go into the detail of all the instrument my purpose here is just to give you the overview of sans and u sense sans is a small angle neutron scattering and u sense is ultra small angle neutron scattering so before i go into that i want to show you something very important so um we, we heard this morning how important surface chemistry is and how important, you know, uh, to study this structure either at surface or in the bulk or overall particle. So, for example, SANS and uh, SACS, which is small angle X-ray scattering, generally are used to study structure from one nanometer to several hundred nanometer. And USANS actually takes the, this level and push it to from 100 nanometer to 20 micron. So by combining SANS and USANS, you can actually study structure from one nanometer all the way to 20 micron. Now, I have seen so many people saying, oh, okay, one nanometer to 20 micron or micron length scale. But uh, just to give you the size perspective, this is quite big size range, okay? So 
here, if you can see on the left hand side of the image that, you know, you can use either X-ray and neutron and those neutron or X-ray goes through your sample and then you get a scattering event. This scattering event, um, you can you this scattering event you can collect on the two dimension detector and when you convert this two dimensional profile it becomes like a one dimensional profile this is the log log scale so basically you get a, a, a q q means the scattering vector so it is starting from the center of the detector going outwards so here is the center of the detector and you are going outward and the intensity whatever the intensity you integrate from the detector so just to give you idea, by combining SANS and USANS, you not only get a smaller information. So in this lens scale here, it is roughly one nanometer. And here, it's roughly 20 micron. So not only you can get smaller particle information, but the bigger particle information. Many people use our facility for other, uh, other uh, so I'm only talking about two instruments, but we have other uh, 13 instrument and two of those instrument called the reflectometry. So if you are interested on to the surface, how actually uh, uh, surface is in terms of, you know, what are the layers and how the uh, thickness profile of your surface is, then you would use uh, uh, a neutron reflectometry. But using SANS and SANS instrument, you can also do what we call grazing incident uh, small angle neutron scattering. So if you are interested on the interface, how the structures are interface, you can use the grazing incident uh, neutron scattering. So now coming back to the size range. So you can see by combining SANS and USANS, you, you get a, such a wide range, okay? So just to give you the size perspective, let's assume you, you are, uh, standing on a hill and taking a photo of this big ship with lots of container. Uh, assume this ship is 20 micron. Okay. Now you are zooming in that photo and looking just a few container that is roughly 250 nanometer. Okay. Now you have the ability to zoom further, go inside the container and look into the one box. This one box dimension is one nanometer. So now that might help you to understand how powerful these techniques are. So if you are interested studying the structure of complex material, you know, uh, generally you need the information at multiple lens scale. And that's why it, it is very important to use this kind of techniques. Now, uh, SEM, TEM, all those kind of electronic microscopics are, are very popular. However, they have some limitation. For example, you have to change sample in order to collect the data. And generally, you know, it's not the same system. On the other side, neutron scattering or X-ray scattering, uh, more, more to the neutron scattering, they are non-destructive techniques. So it doesn't matter. You can put a whole system, study it, and then use the sample again. But also at the same time, you can do a lot of in-situ study. What, what I mean by in-situ, so for example, um, I have seen the uh, abstract and I saw people are interested in catalytical activity so, as well as the battery material. So if you want to see what happening while charging and discharging in the battery, then you can put the whole battery with the whole setup and then use the neutron scattering to understand what, what uh, actually happening inside. The other benefit uh, I want to talk about is the call contrast variation. So what is contrast variation? So for imagine if I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm, I'm standing in front of a black wall, then you would not be able to see half of my body, right? So uh, we do something similar with the neutron scattering. So what we do we, uh, we know H2O and D2O, hydrogenated water and deuterated water, they are chemically same. So if I mix H2O and D2O, you know, it, chemically they, it's not different. However, neutron interacts very differently with uh, H2O and D2O. Basically, neutrons uh, interacts with only nucleus. So that's why, you know, uh, water and heavy water are very different. So H2 and D2 are just an example. You can actually use any solvent and that it's deuterated counterpart. So what we do, we actually, uh, when we study system in uh, solution, then we make, mix hydrogenated and deuterated solvents such a way that it can, it can match the contrast of 
one component out of multi-component system. So for example, if I am studying two surfactant or I'm studying drug solubilization in the surfactant, then what I can do, I can contrast match drug or I can contrast match surfactant to see where how, what is the structure of that uh, mixture is. So that's quite uh, unique. We have amazing national deuteration facility on site. So many people who use molecules which are not easily uh, you can buy in the deuterated form, you can also request uh, for NDF to produce. So uh, so here I want to give you another size, uh, another uh, perspective. Let's assume in this test tube, there are two glass components. One is glass bead and glass wool and the liquid around it has a refractive index quite different from both components. So you can't see it. Now, if I add another liquid so that I can change the refractive index of that liquid to match the glass wool, then suddenly I can see the glass bead. There are, in, in this test tube, there is still two components, you know, glass wool and glass bead, but, uh, but the solvents refractive index is now matched to the glass wood. So we do something similar with the neutron scattering. And here you can see uh, we have, uh, I, I'm just, it's a cartoon representation. So for example, if you are interested in, let's say, core shell kind of particle, uh, and if you have a normal solvent, uh, you can see core and shell. If you match the shell, you can only see the core. If you match the core, you can only see the shell. So this is all up at nanometer lens scale or micrometer lens scale, right? So we do a lot of those kind of neutron scattering experiments. And how do we do? We have multiple instruments. So as I said, I'm only going to talk about a couple of instruments. So here you can see this instrument called Quokka. Quokka is really amazing uh, animal, only found on the one island of Australia, um, most cutest animal. So Quokka is 40 meter long instrument. Next to it is called Bilby. Bilby is uh, another small angle neutron scattering instrument because demand of sm small angle neutron scattering is huge. So we have to build another one. This side is a Kukabara instrument. Kukabara is a bird. And this is called ultra small angle neutron scattering instrument. We also had lab-based small angle neutron scattering instrument, Brooker. Uh, it's now decommissioned, and now we have a brand new uh, Xenox instrument. So when, if you, if you, if you want to use any of this instrument, or if you want to use multiple of this instrument, you basically, what you do, you submit a proposal, you talk to us, uh, instrument scientists, we go through, uh, the science with you and then uh, you can submit the proposal and you can come here and use the instrument. Now, uh, as I said, but today I'm just going to briefly talk about the SANS and USANS instrument. So let's talk about the Quokka. So Quokka is a 40 meter long instrument and um, I'm, I'm not, sorry, I don't have a time to go through the details, but if you are interested on, instead, interested, uh, if you are interested uh, for any of this information, it's available on our website. You can contact me anytime. And also, if you want to hear more, I'm more than happy to go uh, give a talk separately about the instrumentation itself. So Coca is a 40 meter long instrument, and it is mostly used to understand structure from one nanometer to 500 nanometer. And just to show you, uh, I'll, I'll play this nice animation, which shows how Coca works. So we get neutron from the cold guide. Uh, it, it, it is polychromatic neutron and quokka is a monochromatic instrument. So we have to separate neutron. Now we can't use any prism to separate neutron. Uh, so we have, we have this very fast rotating turbine. It, it is very precise. It rotates quite fast. So it blocks for any fast moving neutron or any slow moving neutron. It only allows one speed of neutron. And this one speed of neutron equates to one wavelength and one wavelength goes through then multiple multiple collimation system or multiple guide system and then it finally passed through your sample. Now if you have any uh, scattering object in your sample basically you're going to get a scattering event. Now you collect this scattering profile on onto our detector so our detector is a state-of-the-art detector. In the whole world, there is no such detector which can take so many neutrons. So it's one meter by one meter detector. And in this big tank, you can put 
detector very close to your sample or you can push all the way to 20 meter and in order why do you want to do it so different uh, bigger particles scatters at a uh, smaller angle so you have to push detector quite back to get the information about large particle and if you are interested uh, for even larger particle you would use instrument called u sense kukabara Kukabara is slight, works on a slightly different principle. It's a bones heart instrument, and it has a very precise, this two silicon crystal. So you can see here, we have this five bound silicon crystal and the second uh, silicon crystal. It's like a periscope. So if I'm standing here and shining a torch uh, and you are standing here, if they are perfectly aligned, you can see the torch. But now if I start rocking it, going from negative to positive what happened the intensity goes up and then fall down right this this rotation and then if i put the sample which scatters again if i do the rocking curve the intensity will go down up and come down but at a different rate so we take the advantage of this technique to measure the scattering at particular angle these rotations are super precise. We measure thousandth uh, part of one degree at a time. You know, uh, they are they are they are really amazing uh, uh, engineering instru uh, instrument. Sands like U sands and sands, they both are used for versatile of different materials: cement, rocks, soft matter, hard matter, polymer, catalyst, and so on. You know, um, so if you are interested in applying any of this technique, please feel free to contact me. And we have other instrument related information like how how this instrument work and how uh, in what kind of mode one could use. So we can use two different mode: high intensity mode and high resolution. All this information, by the way, is available on our website. The other, other strong aspect is a sample environment. You can actually do a lot of in-situ work with uh, this technique. So we have amazing sample environment. And I'm going to talk about sample environment a little bit later. This is more specific to the USANS instrument. But I'm going to come for the general uh, sample environment. So now just summarizing, small angle scattering is really powerful technique and it's a whole purpose. Uh, by using small angle scattering, you can get information about the shot size, shape, and the interaction of the particle. And it, it, it is, as I said, it's very versatile technique and also you can do, collect data quite quickly and then you can analyze them as well. Now, sample environment. This is something uh, very important. So we have a range of sample environment on, on our instrument. Uh, for example, if you, if you want to heat your sample up to very high temperature, we can do it. If you, cool, if you want to cool it down to very low temperature, we can do it. We have a lot of electromagnet and uh, cryomagnet, so we can go up to 11 Tesla and reach uh, less than one Kelvin temperature. We also have a stop flow system. So if you want, if you are interested in kinetic information, if you want to mix a couple of sample and see how the kinetic changing, we can do that as well. This is one of my favorite, the rheometer. So a lot of industrial sample and a lot of other sample where you actually want to study in situ rheometer, uh, rheology while you are collecting the small angle scattering profile. So that also we can do it. We have a rotating sample. So if you have a large particle which suffers from gravity, you can use the rotating sample tumbler. We have all kinds of different sample holder, flow cell, you, you name it, you know. And our sample environment is one of the best sample environment in the world. So if you, if you have some other ideas you want to try, you, you can always talk to us. Apart from that, you know, we have a high pressure cell which can go up to uh, 350 megapascals. So it's amazing. And now we are developing another high pressure cell which, which can go into gigapascal, you know. We have, we have in situ differential scanning calorimetry. So this is when, if you want to study the thermal behavior of any material while collecting scattering. So the, I finished my first part of my talk where I just wanted to give you very quick brief overview of, of about our instrument. Now this talk generally is one hour when I talk about the instrument because I can talk under the water. People have to shut me off, you know. So anyway, next time if you want to hear more, please feel free to contact me.
Now I, I'll quickly touch base on the example of a hydrogel system. So my group work lot onto the silk hydrogel material mm. and these materials are becoming very popular why because they have they shown amazing property in biomedical application and one of the application which we are interested in is the tissue repair or, uh, or the targeted uh, delivery so basically you have a, a material silk from from uh, you know silk worm and uh, you can actually use this material to cross link with other material to make a very tough gel, which can help to repair. And as it is natural, your body might uh, not reject it, you know, compared to other material. So uh, this, this uh, work, we have, we have been publishing this work now from last five years in various form, and we are pioneer in uh, making hydrogel out of silk. So, how we make it silk you can make chemical crosslink silk or physical crosslink silk in this example we are using photos uh, initiator and uh, made the uh, gel out of uh, silk so you can see now as this conference is more surface you can see here surface behavior of this gel and uh, surface always goes along with the bulk right so we wanted to make this gel for certain application. So uh, one thing is we want to see how nanostructure of this gel and also the microstructure. Here is the porosity of the gel. Now, why it is important? Because let's say if you want to uh, implant this gel in your body, then you want to make a channel so that blood or other fluid can pass through. So that was the idea. Now, silk makes really nice gel, but it's not very physically strong so we can make gel by mixing silk with this another insect protein called resilin this is found in insect tandem so it's very very strong you know or for another application we can either mix silk with uh, artificial polymer like polyvinyl caprolactam you know so uh, our group has made so many different kind of hydrogel, either mixing with different components for a various application. And now I'll just summarize my talk very quickly because I'm running out the time. But what I wanted to show you is by combining sense and u sense, we have characterized lots of different kind of sample. And what information we get? We get this kind of information now you would say wow that's a boring graph but no it's actually giving information at nanoscale here it giving information at something at larger land scale it also giving information about those porosity we are interested you know and this is the same graph is just a different way of representing it so that we can now see features very clearly so seeing this graph and then running different sample and then comparing them what we have found that we can actually tailor make this gels we can make them such a way that they can become more uh, dry we can make them more hydrophilic so for different application we can make them such a way that they can retain certain molecule at very high capacity and so on. And all this information is not possible to gain by any other method. You know, you have to use neutron scattering, which can go through your system and so on, you know. So if you are more, if you are uh, motivated by this and if you want to use neutron scattering in future, you know, please feel free to contact me. In India, uh, at Baba Atomic Research Center, we have also small angle neutron scattering instrument. My whole PA I have used Baba Atomic Research Center uh, facility so much for, for the work. And um, I'm, I'm always thankful there. So either you can go there or you can contact us, you know. Uh, this all facilities are government facility, I must say, you know, so you have to apply for the beam time, you have to go through. Just to give you idea, like on, on my instrument, uh, one day of beam time cost Australian government 10,000 Australian dollar right so it's a very specialized technique so you have to have very good uh, uh, reason to use the neutron scattering but don't put off by that please contact me if you are interested uh, to use our instrument so now i'll just summarize you know like uh, it's an um, amazing technique and you can use it to understand either the form factor, which is the particle shape or structure uh, uh, sh shape size, or you can also use it for the structure factor, like interparticle interaction and so on. Um, 
other thing is if you are interested in submitting beam time, it's generally twice a year, either it's 15 March or 15 February due to COVID. We are uh, fin finishing uh, beam time on 15th of February, which is next week. That's why I've been very busy working with those proposals. Um, but, you know, if not this time, next time, contact me and we can submit there. Okay, so by by doing that, I just want to thank all of you uh, for your uh, kind attention for my talk, and I'm more than uh, happy to take any questions. I finish intentionally early so that I, I get a question. I really, really enjoy uh, interactive two-way communication. So if you have any question, please ask me. Uh, and in my email address, you know, you can Google me and uh, you, you can find my email address. So if not today, please do send me your questions. Appreciation for uh, Dr. Jitendra Mata. My colleague Karthikeyan, Professor Karthikeyan, will give the uh, things. Thank you, madam. Uh, it's very nice to hear your talk, sir. It's a very, uh, uh, very pleasant, very pleasant morning. We had a very good talk. And at the end of the talk, you talked about hydrogels. So we are all very much uh, uh, interested on hydrogels, and I hope. Definitely all participants also will agree that. And uh, recently we came to know you have invented a fire retardant polymer uh, dress, ultra thin dresses. We are hmm. very much uh, uh, eager to know if you tell one or two lines on that uh, so that all will be happy. Yeah. And uh, uh, whenever in next lecture, sir. Okay. Whenever. Or uh, if participants, if you have any question or you can send a mail to the uh, speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kindly, I request Dr. T. Vitya Sagar, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, to introduce invited lecture speaker. Good morning to everyone of you. Good morning to everyone of you. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Arun Kumar Pagi, for this virtual international conference, such 2022. Dr. Arun Kumar Pati is currently working as Professor, Department of Chemistry, Central University of Jharkhand. So before joining into Central University of Jharkhand, Dr. Arun Kumar Pati worked as a, as a faculty member in National Institute of Science and Technology, Berghampur, from 1996 to 2013. Dr. Arun Kumar Pati received his uh, MSc degree as well as uh, PhD from Bahambur University. He just did his postdoctoral fellowship from Denver University during the period of 2001 to 2002. Uh, he served as a head department of chemistry, Central University of Jharkhand, also Dean School of Natural Sciences and a MOOC coordinator in the Central University. Dr. Arun Kumar Padi is also a recipient of Young Scientist Award, Orissa Government, also a fellow of Sastri indo canadian Fellowship. He has several publications in reputed international journals to his credit. His area of research is heterocyclic synthesis, organic mediated synthesis of metal oxide nanoparticles for various applications. Now I request Dr. Arun Kumar Padi to deliver his lecture on synthesis and electrochemical applications of surface decorated metal oxide nanoparticles. 
now i uh, invite dr arun kumar padi to deliver his lecture thank you sir thank you sir Uh, good morning. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank. I I hope I am audible. Uh, audible. Oh yes, sir. Yes, audible, sir. audible sir. Okay, thank you. Welcome, uh, sir. Good morning, one and all. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers to provide me the opportunity to speak on this forum of. Uh, uh, the surface chemistry 2022. Uh, my special thanks uh, to Professor Sasmita Das uh, for inviting me, extending the invitation for this invited talk. Uh, uh, let me share my uh, slides. Uh, today morning, we have uh, uh, listened to a wonderful uh, talk by Dr. Jitender Mata. And uh, Mostly, my talk will be confined to the synthesis and electrochemical application of surface decorate and metal oxide nanoparticles. Although now uh, I'm basically, uh, I got the training in organic chemistry, but with course of time and as the situation demands, uh, I have switched over the organic knowledge to synthesis of some of the metal oxide nanoparticles. And uh, thereafter, uh, further extending uh, the application of such metal oxide nanoparticles uh, into uh, electrochemical aspect or the electrochemical studies of these things as the electrode material for the supercapacitor or as an glucose and electrochemical glucose sensing or electrochemical ammonia sensing. Uh, also, we have tried our hands uh, with respect to uh, photodegradation of some of the uh, dyes. Uh, mostly the methylene blue we have considered and also a little bit corrosion study. To start off with, uh, uh, why metal oxides? We know that uh, metal oxides are efficient electroactive materials. Uh, they are transparent electromagnetic shielding materials also. They are widely utilized as a photocatalyst, as a sensor both uh, in device form or in the electrochemical sensing. And most widely, some of the metal oxides are being utilized uh, as a coating to passivate the surface against corrosion. So uh, what we have did is that we have thought uh, of uh, extending our uh, organic and uh, inorganic hybrid compounds and the immidazole framework based metal oxides. And, uh, these oxides has uh, currently found a wide application in the terms of catalysis and photocatalysis, dye sensitized solar cells, environmental remediation and chemical synthesis, catalyst for the purpose of fine chemicals. You can have the sensors or the biomedical applications as well as the automobiles applications. And in addition to that, the hot cake that is going on across the uh, globe is the energy devices like supercapacitors and batteries. So looking to this uh, wide applicability, uh, we have thought that we can try our hands. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I got a student now who is weak in organic chemistry, PhD student. 
So uh, he said, sir, I am not uh, good in organic chemistry. So can we try something else? I said, okay, fine. We can do one or two step of the standard uh, organic uh, reaction, which we have already practiced it out. So you do that. And thereafter we extended it uh, to the physical aspect of this. So it take a shape in a different way. And uh, from organic, I enter into this field because of that student. So uh, this is uh, what uh, we are doing uh, in our lab uh, that we are taking a diastyl monoxim uh, and condensing with uh, aromatic aldehydes to give you the one hydroxy uh, imidazole derivatives. So uh, this uh, already we have published in Tetlet. And in the same paper, uh, what we have extrapolated is that we have prepared the uh, zinc salt of these imidazoles. And then we have calcinated and we obtained the uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles. Uh, this is uh, way back in 2010, we have done that one. Uh, the uh, Sasmita Mishra, she was working for some time with me. So she did all this work. So we obtained uh, the nanoparticles, but at that time we have not explored the physical, we have just confined our work over there. Later on when this student joined, uh, then we thought that uh, we should extrapolate it out. So this is the general schematic uh, that we are talking of, uh, the general schematic uh, of these things. So again, I have mentioned the same uh, literature that I have later we have published in 2010. So with that experience, uh, when this uh, student joined, I thought that why we should not extrapolate it out uh, for his work. So we uh, taken off uh, the things here. I am confining uh, some of our areas, mostly uh, tin oxide and its composite, then manganese oxide, uh, uh, then we have got the binary oxide of zinc and manganese, and then we have and their composite. Then we have got the zinc oxide that we have prepared uh, in 2010. That also we have explored a little bit. So uh, this has been recently published uh, in uh, Journal of the Electrochemical Society. So the facile synthesis of uh, the title is reading like that, uh, tin oxide nanoparticles. So uh, this has uh, got an electrochemical and the sensor application we have obtained. Uh, this the schematic of the preparation of the uh, tin oxide and thereby the it's composite with reduced graphene oxide. Uh, so what uh, we did is that we have prepared this imidazole then metal complex uh, with tin. Then we calcined it to get the tin oxide uh, nanoparticles. Then we have dispersed it with respect to the graphene oxide and we obtained the composite tin oxide over the reduced graphene oxide. So we have characterized uh, uh, these things with respect to the uh, FTIR and uh, you could see that this broadening is because of the probably the water molecules which are existing upon. So the 521 uh, nanometer centimeter inverse you will find uh, the thin uh, OH stretching then 615 the anti-symmetric uh, stretching of the SNO uh, then 1580 centimeter attributed to the RGO remaining which is the uh, red one and that is your composite. And uh, further, we have also characterized with respect to the XRD. So uh, from the XRD, it has been observed that the tin oxide has got a uh, nanoparticle size of the uh, range of uh, 40 nanometer around uh, the average size. Whereas uh, the when it has been dispersed over the reduced graphene oxide, uh, the uh, particle you know, size has been uh, reduced and the average size uh, has been calculated to be 11.25 nanometer. Uh, the reduction of the size is uh, because of the uh, reduced graphene oxide. Uh, it uh, inhibits uh, the agglomeration of the tin oxide and that's the reason the size is uh, decreasing up and over there. We have also characterized uh, the uh, oxide and the reduced graphene oxide composite uh, with respect to the Raman spectra, uh, the 490 centimeter inverse uh, vibrational mode of the oxide ion and the 620 centimeter is the uh, A1G for the symmetric. And also we have observed the significant D and G 
uh, bands. Uh, the broadening is because of the reduced graphene oxide uh, in things. We have also calculated the band gap uh, from the UV visible spectral pattern, and uh, uh, you find that uh, the band gap is uh, for the tin oxide, it is a 3.77 electron volt, whereas uh, when it has been dispersed over the reduced graphene oxide, it is being reduced up to 3.33, or roughly you can say 3.4. Also, we have uh, extrapolated the surface uh, behavior, so we've gone for the bed surface area analysis. And there we found the uh, tin oxide having the surface area of 120 meters square per gram. On the other hand, the uh, composite has got a 145 meters square per gram. And uh, the pore size, we have observed that uh, the, it is uh, ranging from 15 to 40 uh, nanometer. For the tin oxide, it is approaching more or less uh, the 40 nanometer, but uh, with respect to the reduced graphene oxide, the pore size, that, that means it is a more porous material than what we have expected happen. So uh, that's the reason it is quite suitable enough for the catalytic activity uh, as well as the things. And uh, we have also uh, studied the morphology uh, using FECM and uh, this is the FECM and the index plot for both the tin oxide as well as the uh, com its composite with reduced graphene oxide. Uh, we have done the elemental mapping uh, with respect to uh, the uh, FECM uh, image that we have obtained. And also uh, we have gone uh, for the express analysis uh, to know uh, the uh, status of the tin oxide. And uh, it has been observed uh, that uh, the express, uh, the lattice air oxygen in oxygen, tin oxide uh, is having uh, this Whereas the existence of the oxygen oxide ion and in uh, the composite, it has been significantly observed with respect to this uh, peak uh, around uh, uh, 535, uh, 533 uh, electron volt by, and the binding energy correspond to that. Also, we have observed uh, the carbon oxygen peak as well as the carbon carbon double bond peak corresponding to the reduced graphene oxide. So uh, what we will find, what we find from this, that uh, you will find the tin is uh, having the 3D aspect, and uh, uh, accordingly uh, the tetragonal structure uh, of the tin oxide uh, has been observed also. Then we have uh, carried out uh, the measurement of the specific capacitance value for both the uh, tin oxide as well as the its composite with RGO. So here the uh, with respect to the uh, various uh, scan rates, uh, we have observed uh, the variation of the uh, specific capacitance value. So you could see there is a, by the incorporation of the reduced graphene oxide, there is a huge change uh, in the capacitance value uh, that we have observed. And uh, followed by, uh, we have also gone for the Ragon plot and we find the energy density. Uh, which has been quite significant enough. Uh, thereafter, we have gone for the charging and discharging plot. And what we observe over here, the tin oxide, uh, you see the charging discharging is very narrow. Whereas in case of your the composite, it is uh, quite used. And that's the reason it can be kept, uh, thought probable that it can be used as the electrode material for the uh, batteries. Now, uh, we know that uh, how we can utilize it because uh, right now, uh, the, this sort of uh, research with respect to the electron materials in the batteries is also going to be saturated up. And so we thought that uh, as we are going and also uh, Professor Essen Sao has done uh, in the IOP long back has done the uh, glucose estimation. So we thought that can we uh, make a electrochemical sensor over there uh, for detection of the glucose? So sensing of the glucose. So we have carried out the electrochemical sensing uh, So the cyclic uh, voltammeter aspect that also we have obtained. And uh, the, what we have done is that normally whatever the glucose sensing is being done is uh, with respect to the enzymatic glucose sensing, uh, it has been done in the uh, conventional method. 
uh, but it has got certain demerits uh, in the enzymatic path as uh, it has got a thermal instability. Uh, it is being getting affected with respect to humidity and pH. Uh, on the uh, other hand, if you are going for the non-enzymatic path of uh, your glucose sensing, then uh, uh, it is a high advantage because uh, you can have a, if you have got a suitable material, then it will have a surface uh, morphology and structure that helps uh, in the oxidation uh, of the glucose to glucolactone. And that's the reason it can be used up. There are uh, so many uh, uh, examples that has been observed in the literature, uh, uh, but few are there with respect to the, uh, the tin oxide uh, and the reduced tin oxide. Uh, so we have explored those things with respect to the glucose sensing uh, and what we have observed the amperometric uh, glucose sensing over there, the calibration curve. And uh, you could see the from there we will find that the lower detection limit of the uh, glucose is 0 0.0026 micromolar, uh, and the sensitivity refers to 177, which is a uh, very uh, high with respect to the surface area of 0.282 uh, centimeter square. So we have carried out a comparison uh, with reference to the literature available uh, data and our uh, result. And what we could observe is that uh, you could see the lower detection limit uh, in most of the case. Only uh, this one we could find uh, the copper oxide nanoparticles over cerium metal oxide uh, framework. There you find uh, the lower detection limit is two nanometer. Uh, the rest, rest all are uh, nanomolar. Uh, so the rest all are above it. So our uh, Com composite, the tin oxide over reduced graphene oxide is quite uh, efficient with the lower detection limit of 6.4 nanometer. And you could see the uh, range of the concentration we have observed over that, the glucose sensing from 20 micromolar to uh, 380. Uh, and these are the corresponding literatures that where we have taken into consideration for the comparison. So to conclude, uh, what we have observed, the tin oxide nanoparticles and the, its composite with uh, reduced graphene oxide uh, has a wide applicability, uh, having a very good one for the supercapacitor application uh, and has got an enhanced uh, specific capacitance value. And uh, the uh, non-enzymatic glucose sensing uh, has found to be a lower uh, detection limit over there. Now, for the second part, uh, we have uh, extended our work uh, with reference to the uh, binary uh, metal oxide and its composite with uh, reduced graphene oxide. And uh, here also, we have uh, initially determined its application as the electrode material for the supercapacitor. Uh, and then we went for the ammonia sensing. So this has been published in 2019. Uh, in ionics. So again, this is the schematic. Uh, so first, so we have prepared separately. Uh, you can have uh, two way. Over, uh, you can have two way over the synthesizing. Uh, two way of synthesizing the nanoparticle uh, binary nanoparticles. Uh, either you can prepare uh, the zinc oxide nanoparticle in a separate model or your uh, manganese in separate, then you combine them, go for the ultrasonic proper dispersion, and then you calcinate to get the binary uh, uh, oxide over there. And then, or otherwise, you can also have the mixture of the complexes and you calcinate directly to get uh, this. And then you disperse it over the graphene oxide uh, followed by calcination. You obtain the composite over the reduced graphene oxide. Now, uh, this also we have analyzed with reference to the FTIR analysis. And uh, these are the uh, comparisons or the uh, FTIR data that are there showing that the uh, binary formation of the binary metal oxide as well as the, the composite. The Raman analysis also we have done and uh, we could able to see uh, the various peaks uh, corresponding to 326, 378, 438, 574. 
uh, with reference to the zinc oxide and N doping confirmed by the uh, broadband peaks at 5 centi 70 nanometer. And then uh, peaks at 341 in the composite, uh, you could see that uh, these things are there, plane bending. Plane bend bending. Then uh, we have also carried out the uh, uh, zinc oxide, uh, the XRD, and uh, what we have calculated it out from the XRD data, the average crystalline mm -hmm. size of the composite is 18.09 nanometer. So the surface morphology is being uh, studied uh, with reference to the FSM, and also we have uh, gone for the TEM and uh, we could find the uh, particle sizes corresponding to the uh, in the composite. It is around 18 uh, nanometer, 20 nanometer around. Then we have gone for the uh, surface area uh, determination, and uh, what we could see that uh, the uh, binary metal oxide has got a 181 millimeter square per gram surface area. On the contrary, the composite has got a 195 meter square. Uh, per gram surface area and the average pore size uh, you, when we went for the distribution of the pore size the average pore size has been found at pv 42 to 80 nanometer and the cyclic voltammetry analysis uh, you could see uh, uh, these things uh, what you could see for uh, manganese oxide uh, you will find the uh, specific capacitance value is 24 for Faraday per gram uh, for uh, end of uh, zinc oxide, it is 48.69 per per gram, uh, whereas the binary metal oxide has got a 77.50 per per gram, and uh, the composite has got 252.7. There is an enormous uh, enhancement of the specific capacitance value as we move from the binary oxide to the uh, composite with reduced graphene oxide. And uh, uh, this is the dragon plot as well as the bar plot for uh, different oxides and their composite. Uh, then we have analyzed also the charging and discharging. Uh, the individual oxides, they do not show that much significant charging and discharging plot, whereas the um, binary metal oxide has shown significant charging and discharging level, which has been indicated by blue. When we shifted to the reduced graphene oxide, uh, further enhancement in the charging discharging. So both uh, the binary oxide as well as the uh, composite it's with res reduced uh, graphene oxide can be used as the electrode material for your uh, thing. Uh, then uh, we have plotted with the Nikesh plot uh, and we have observed that the, uh, you see that the parallel line that you are observing for the composite with reference to the y-axis indicates that, uh, that it is a good material uh, for the supercapacitor, uh, because you see that uh, this hop uh, that your semicircle that you are observing is very, very small indeed, and uh, indicating that it is a uh, better su uh, supercapacitating material uh, because of the internal uh, resistance is being reduced substantially. If you look to the manganese oxide alone, the internal resistance is very, very high indeed, but uh, with respect to the uh, composite, it has been reduced drastically. And then uh, again, uh, we have extended our uh, search for these things with, with respect to the uh, gas sensing and uh, the amperometric curve we have observed. And initially there is a, a decrease in the uh, sensing over there. Uh, this has been attributed because of the involvement of the reduced graphene oxide. And uh, we have observed these things and thereby you will find the saturation aspect and the lower detection limit of the uh, ammonia uh, has found to be 0.47 uh, parts per million uh, as we have been detecting up and and the proposed mechanism here we have provided with respect to the uh, ammonia sensing uh, and we have compared the data our observation with respect to the literature availability and uh, what we could the last one is our finding uh, it is in one molar KOH, you could see that people have used a higher molar potassium hydroxides and they have observed the higher values over there, no doubt at all. But uh, this is very high concentration uh, solution over the alkaline solution. But 
with respect to one molar KOH, you could see that I, we are obtaining a very good specific capacitance value over here. So that is what uh, the thing what we have observed in our finding. Uh, to conclude, uh, what we have observed that uh, air synthesized material uh, has been can be applied for the supercapacitor application uh, as it has a better better charge storage capacity as we have observed from the charging and discharging ability. Further, uh, the composite is being employed for the ammonia sensing and the lower detection limit has found to be 0.47 ppm. Uh, then, uh, as I told you, again, I'm pointing out this is uh, the thing for the uh, our second, uh, third part that we are coming across. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, this story goes way back uh, to 2008, something like that. Uh, so uh, when I visited uh, um, the hydrometallurgy division of the CSR MMT, uh, then I interacted with the head of the department, uh, who is no more Dr. R.P. Das. So uh, he suggested uh, that uh, why you are not looking for the zinc oxide material. Uh, in fact, uh, he was talking to my wife, who is a scientist at CSR MMT. So uh, I took that uh, point which I overheard and uh, thereafter I thought that why I, we should not explore it out. So I have, uh, we have prepared the complex of the zinc with our imidazole and then we obtained the zinc oxide. In 2010, as I have shown earlier, the, we have published this paper, but at that time we have not analyzed much. But uh, after that we have analyzed it out and we have found that uh, it is not the zinc oxide alone, it, the nitrogen, is being uh, doped over there. So uh, the beauty over there is that uh, we are not utilizing any source, external source for the nitrogen doping. Uh, the imidazole, from the imidazole, the nitrogen is coming and getting doped it out over there. So we have characterized the XRD analysis, as I told you that at that time, uh, we have not uh, explored the zinc oxide only. We have uh, prepared and reported the uh, structure and the nanomaterial synthesis uh, using imidazole derivative. And uh, this student has explored these things. Uh, so we carried out the uh, XRD analysis. We have dispersed the uh, zinc oxide, uh, the nitrogen doped zinc oxide over reduced graphene oxide. And then we have uh, carried out the SAM and EDAX measurement. And we have observed that uh, appropriate uh, doping is there, nitrogen as well as the uh, uh, the reduced graphene oxide, it, the dispersion is quite significant. The TAM image of the you know, nitrogen doped zinc oxide, uh, we could see that it is of the range of uh, around 40 nanometer. Uh, we have also calculated the surface area for the zinc oxide and doped zinc oxide, uh, and it corresponds to 172.95 meters square per gram with the average pore size uh, ranging from 15 to 30 nanometer. All the materials that we are synthesizing from imidazole derivative, we have observed that uh, they are quite porous in nature. And uh, we have also carried out the Raman analysis of the end of zinc oxide. Uh, then uh, we thought that uh, in Angio Camp uh, in 2000, sorry, in Langmuir uh, in 2010, it has been come across that uh, the imidazole can be used as a oxide. I mean, as a corrosion inhibition when it has been uh, done with respect to the oxide layer, if you are giving, then it protects. So we thought that can we think of the zinc oxide, no, no, end of zinc oxide to have some corrosion inhibition. So one of uh, my MSc project student, uh, he carried out uh, these things and uh, initial data uh, we have observed. Uh, this has not been published yet. Uh, because some more data is there. So then uh, Tafel plot shows significant uh, things which have very low uh, corrosion current. Uh, so that indicates that uh, the material is quite significantly effective uh, for the uh, uh, prevention of the corrosion with respect to the mild steel uh, in sodium chloride solution. Then uh, the impedance spectroscopy also we have measured. Uh, to see that its applicability further, uh, you see that the zinc oxide is having a resistance uh, 
for the mobility of the electron, but when it has been dispersed over the reduced graphene oxide because of the conducting ability of the graphene oxide material, uh, this uh, resistance has been decreased. And that's the reason this specific capacitance is increasing upon. Uh, then uh, the last part, uh, we thought that uh, when we know that the zinc oxides are very good ones uh, for the photodegradation of the methylene blue dye. So we thought that can our compound, the nitrogen doped zinc oxide will be efficient enough uh, to protect, uh, sorry, for a degradation of the methylene blue dye. So we have explored and we have observed, uh, we have taken the 250 nanometer uh, light as well as the 350 nanometer light and we have observed that uh, significant degradation of the methylene blue, okay corresponding when we are using the 250 nanometer light uh, corresponding to that we have got 80.95 percent degradation with a very short period of time uh, and uh, for 350 nanometer it is 82.59 uh, percent degradation over a period of two hour in both the cases when it has been kept in dark so uh, we have carried it out uh, these things and we have observed uh, the observation and we provided a suitable mechanism, proposed a mechanism for that. And uh, this has been uh, significantly uh, well done. Uh, and we have compared uh, the dye degradation with respect to the literature data and uh, with respect to the irradiation time also. This is our uh, result that we have observed over here uh, in comparison to the other data that we come across. Uh, so, we, in conclusion, what we can observe that uh, the tuffel plot and the um, shows that uh, this uh, end of zinc oxide uh, has got some anti corrosion behavior and uh, also has a potential for degrading the methylene, methylene blue. Now, uh, to acknowledge, I acknowledge the Central University of Jharkhand uh, for providing the facilities, whatever it is available. Uh, to Dr. Mamta Mahapatra, who is my better half, uh, who is a principal scientist at CSR MMT Bhuneshwar, who has extended a little bit of help in uh, carrying out of the SAM and TEM uh, MSS. Uh, uh, he is uh, Dr. Benjamin Raz, uh, my PhD student, who has carried out all the work, and uh, Mr. Amit Kumar, who was uh, the MSc student, who carried out the uh, corrosion study of the uh, end of zinc oxide. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I have finished in time. Ma'am, it is over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Padi, for your excellent talk. And, uh, we would like to have some question also. I think uh, for lack of time, we are not able to proceed with uh, question sessions. And we will yeah. let you know by email, please. Sure, sure, ma'am. I will Thank be happy you. to answer those questions. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Participants ask questions to speaker mailing. Now I in invite uh, Dr. N. P. Reynuka, uh, next invited speaker, lectures to speaker. I invite Dr. Prof, uh, Dr. M. Shanti, Professor, Department of Chemistry, to introduce the speaker. So, good morning to all. I am very happy to introduce today's invited speaker, Professor Dr. M. K. Renga, Madam. She received her master's degree from University of Calicut, Kerala in 1995 and PhD degree from Cochin University of Science and Technology in 2001. She started a professional career at University of Calicut in 2004. Currently, she is working as a professor in the Department of Chemistry, University of Calicut, Kerala. Her research field of material science, specifically focusing on carbon nanomaterials and metal oxides. Applications of these materials in catalysis, sensors, and atmospheric water harvesting are examined. She produced nine PhDs 
She published 60 research papers in various international journals. She has attended different seminars and conferences and presented her research articles. Today, she is going to tell you a lecture on surface functionalized graphene for water remediation. With this introduction, I invite Professor Dr. N.K. Renga, ma'am, to present her invited lectures. Welcome, madam. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words for introduction. Shall I share my screen? Yes. Yes, madam, you can share. Yes, ma'am. At the outset, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Sasmita Das and the Department of Chemistry of Anamalai University for giving me this opportunity to tell this platform. And today I would like to discuss, discuss some of our works on graphene, which we did in water remediation a few years ago. And this is a brief outline of the talk, some introductory slides on graphene and functionalization, followed by two parts discussion. First part deals with the PET-based optical sensors using graphene, and the second part is on adsorbents made using graphene for pollutants in a solution. Graphene, I am sure you all know what, I, what is graphene now. The previous speaker has already mentioned the name in the seminar. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Your screen is not visible. Pardon? Your screen is not visible, ma'am. No, Please no, share. No, it's fine. Oh, okay. Ah, now fine. No, yes, can you see it, ma'am? No, it is audible. Now. Audible. Shall I continue? Uh, yeah, yes, continue? Yes, please continue. Okay, graphene is the latest entry in carbon nano world. And as you know, it is derived from graphite, the single layer material of graphite. And the first synthesis, successful synthesis of graphene was made in 2004 by these two scientists from Manchester mm -hmm. University. And they achieved this achievement from graphite by continuously peeling off individual layers of graphite using an adhesive tape. They could manage to get a simple graphene layer. And we found they found that it has got astounding properties. And for their work, they received Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. And usually in the case of pure graphene, usually obviously they will, we will be expecting only sp2 carbons in a plane. But when we carry out the synthesis in a wet atmosphere or in water, there will be definitely some associated functional groups like carboxyl, hydroxyl, and epoxide groups on the surface. So sp3 defects also will be there in the graphene matrix. And it's also therefore called this reduced Isn't graphene oxide. Sorry for the disturbance. Uh, please share your slides more. Not I visible, mean... ma'am. Not visible your slides more. Okay. Please okay. share. Uh, is it okay now? Oh, ah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thanks. Now you can you see the enlarged version? Ah, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So we are discussing ah. about graphene, as already mentioned. So we'll expect usually an sp2 structure, usually, but there will be definitely functional groups, and often we'll call it as a reduced graphene oxide moiety with sp3 defects. And it has a one, one atom thick species and has got some remarkable features. It's the most reactive form of carbon, and it's the strongest material ever discovered thousand times stronger than steel and zero band gap material. It has got high electric as well as thermal conductivities and it has got theoretical surface area very large because one gram of graphene can even cover a football ground. Very light, flexible and very brittle. It has got hydrophobic character also. And due to this, it finds applications in bio devices, electronics, etc. Sorry. And then gas separation, energy production, storage, water remediation, sensors, etc. And the functionalization of the material graphene with suitable moieties widens the applicability of the material in different areas and can be functionalized in two different ways. One is a covalent functionalization where electron, electron sharing will be due to covalent bond formation. And the examples are addition of free radicals or dienophiles on sp2 carbons and amide formation, etc are the examples for covalent functionalization. 
and then we have the non covalent functionalization which leads to supramolecular assemblies and the driving forces are pi pi stacking electrostatic forces pi ion forces hydrogen bonding etc and this non covalent functionalization we will focus on in this present lecture and that leads to a uh, numerous applications in the different fields like biological environmental material synthesis etc and here we are in the first part we will be discussing the photo induced electron transfer or pet based optical sensors that we made out of graphene and specifically graphene rhodamine 60 supramolecular assembly we will discuss and here we have the two components graphene and rhodamine 60 and as you know rhodamine 60 is a pink colored dye and the main interaction or attractive force between these two is the pi pi interaction as you can see here it's a model is given and apart from that there will be some dispersion forces that arises due to nh and oh groups present between these molecules and what happens is, is when graphene is in contact with the rhodamine 60s particles in aqueous dispersion there will be intermolecular force of attraction weak forces of attraction that leads to supramolecular assembly formation as shown here this is the model of that and here we go for the synthesis method this is the hammers method well known method starting from graphite First, we will oxidize graphite to get the graphite oxide, and then we will exfoliate by ultrasonic reaction to separate the different layers, and that will leave graphene oxide, which upon reduction will give graphene, or simply reduced graphene oxide due to the presence of functional groups on that. Then we move to the characterization, and we found that it is a sheet-like carbon-like material with functional groups COOH. then oh and epoxide groups which was further confirmed by the xps spectroscopy and the raman spectroscopy and the raman spectroscopy is an important tool for characterization characterization of graphitic materials because if it is a pure sp2 hybrid material without any sp3 defect as you can see here you can have only the g band which accounts for the cc vibrations in plane which is present in graphene and as and when we substitute the sp2 carbon with an functional group it becomes sp3 and definitely the orientation will be as some sort of tetrahedral and there will be cc out of plane or breathing vibrations also will be there and here in this system you can see that we have got two bar two bands t band as well as t bands and definitely it is a functionalized graphene or reduced graphene oxide that we have obtained where oh groups coh groups and epoxy groups are present in the system then we'll come back to our graphene rhodamine 60 supramolecular assembly and the consequence of this assembly formation is that the photophysical features of the dye is modified in presence of graphene photophysical features we are familiar with the jablonski diagram here we'll be talking about the fluorescence which is the concomitant emission of radiation with absorption without much time lag which happens in the duration of nanoseconds so we'll be concentrating on the fluor fluorometric assay so here you can see the rhodamine solution kept under uv radiation which fluoresces in the pinkish orange color and if you are adding graphene to it as we have already mentioned there is the formation of supramolecular assembly between gra graphene and rhodamine 60 and as a result under uv radiation the luminescence of the system is quenched as shown in the figure and it is more visible in the spectroscopy data fluorescent spectroscopy fluorometric as say you can see that the topmost curve accounts for pure rhodamine while the others when you add successively graphene you can see that the fluorescence fluorescence of the system is successively quenched by the addition of graphene and this is accounted by the photo induced electron transfer or pet that is taking place in the system here what happens is rhodamine gets ex excited in the presence of photons and the excited electron is given to the graphene which acts as an acceptor of electrons or pointer as a result the electron is no more available for the radiative relaxation or fluorescence and here fluorophore is the donor here and graphene is normally the acceptor and this assembly that is the solution which contains the supramolecular assembly of graphene and rhodamine which quenched the luminescence is our present sensing unit and here you can see the image of the solution under visible light so this is our sensor Then we analyzed various metal ions and other analytes for possible interference with the optical property of the supramolecular assembly, and we found that mercury ions are able to enhance the fluorescence of the quenched luminescence of the dye in presence of graphene. As you can see here, 
Mercury ions is increasing the fluorescence of the system to the same pinkish orange color. And it's evident from the fluorescence spectral data also. Sensor has got a quenched luminescence. And while the presence of mercury enhances the fluorescence as given by the green line. So we have traced about 19 metal ions starting from mercury, cadmium, lead, iron, copper, zinc, etc. 19 metal ions we tested. We could see that only mercury is able to make such a change. And the first red bar, which is the lengthy bar, which represents the mercury. And the third one, which is having a mild and lung, is red. And the last but one, it is a mixture of all ions except the mercury, so that the mixture of ions is not able to produce a fluorescence enhancement. And the last, but last bar shows that as and when we add a drop of mercury to the mixture of ions, the restoration of luminescence is again increased. So it is assuring that the unit can be used as a highly selective inter interference-free sensor for fluorometric sensor for mercury ions. And it is visible through this image also. And you can see here that we have several solutions of metal ions in contact with the sensor unit. Only mercury is able to enhance the luminescence as given by this orange luminescence. Now you see what is the relevance of mercury sensor. As you all know, the toxic heavy metal ions are mercury, cadmium, arsenic, chromium, lead, etc. are highly toxic. And mercury is ranked 16 toxicity and is a toxic kind of global concern. It is non biodegradable nature, long range transport in the atmosphere, persistence in the environment, biomagnification through the food chain. And here we have listed the toxic attributes of mercury, and we have heard of mercury poisoning. And acute mercury exposure leads to cutaneous and neurological disorder, loss of consciousness, then to coma, and finally death. And along to this, the maximum amount of mercury permissible in water is projected to be two parts per billion by the World Health Organization. I know what is the, it's the lowest concentration. That means we have two milligram in 10 raised to six gram of the solvent is allowed. So it comes around in the 10 nanomolar concentration. And when we talk about the mercury poisoning, we cannot forget the Minamata disaster, which took place in 1956 in Minamata Bay in Japan. Some fertilizer company discharged ethyl mercury containing wastewater to the sea and the fish got contaminated and through fish, humans, and other beings. And more than 3,000 people were died in the incident. And after that, this sort of mercury poisoning is known as Minamata disease. I am I'm sure you have heard of that. Now, that shows the importance of quantification of mercury in water. Then we tried for quantification. And this was the observation that we obtained. You see here, the sensor has got a fluorescence given by the bottommost curve. And if you are adding increasing amount of mercury to this solution, you can see that progressive increase in the luminescence is there. And an interesting observation was that the change in luminescence intensity was found to be linear with the concentration of mercury ions. Here it is given in the micromolar concentration. Now, what is the importance of this observation? Just like beer Lambert's law, if you know what is the intensity of the solution, fluorescence of the solution, you can find what is the concentration of mercury ions. And the beauty of the experiment is that this type of linear variation of intensity of luminescence with concentration was maintained throughout a wide range of concentrations as shown here, micromolar, nanomolar, picomolar. And it's an important aspect because most of the fluorometric sensors lack such a linear variation over a wide range of concentration. And as per this, the lowest amount of mercury that we could detect was found to be 19 picomolar, which comes around 380 parts per trillion. trillion that much lower concentration. Then based on the detection strategy, we try to make a solid state sensor, which is benefited by anti-on-site operation. And again, we prepared a sensor unit made of uh, filter paper, normal filter paper, which operates under the near UV lamp illumination. You can see the images of filter paper that has impregnated with the graphene rhodomy 60 solution. The first one, what we did is we took the filter paper pieces and immersed it in a dispersion containing graphene and rhodomine 60. We kept it for 24 hours and just heated it under mild conditions of 30 degrees, dried it. Then the first image shows it is the sensor unit. It has got blue luminescence. Actually, it is not luminescent, but blue luminescence arises from the bleaching agents of the paper. And as and when we add smaller amounts of mercury to it, you can see that there is an enhancement in the luminescence. 
and in, yes, the, in the concentration of mercury increases in the system, the luminescence intensity is also increasing. A concentration range of 4 micromolar to 0 0.5, sorry, 4 micromolar concentration is given here. So it assures that it can be used as a solid state sensor which performs under the influence of a mere UV radiation. So that's a good result. And the same sort of change in luminescence or increase in optical property can be achieved by UV observers also, but although the concentration that we can detect is only in the nanomolar range. Then the, when we probed the mechanism, we found out that there is the photo-induced electron transfer is there in operating in the phenomenon. So first we measured the lifetime of rhodomine 60 dye, and we found that it is 5.28 nanoseconds. Then in presence of graphene, the lifetime is reduced to 3.7 nanoseconds. And as and when we introduce the mercury, again, the lifetime is increased. So it is operating here, or photo-induced electron transfer is there in the process. And then we ruled out some other possibilities. We checked for direct interaction of rhodomine 60 with mercury, and we found that there is no direct interaction of mercury with rhodomine 60. And for this, we used the UV visible absorbance curve. And as an experiment that we did this, we took the enhanced luminescence solution, that is sensor plus mercury, and we added EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, which is a strong chelatic agent to the solution. So the observation was that the mercury-induced increase in luminescence is being now quenched, or absorbance is now quenched in presence of EDTA. And this is explained by the higher affinity of mercury towards EDTA, which forms a stronger complex than compared to the graphene mercury interaction. So based on that, we proposed a scheme for it, as you can see here. When the rhodomine 60 dye is in combination with graphene, it has got a switched off luminescence, which is erased, in, erased again, which in presence of mercury ions, as rhodomine is set free from the graphene surface. And by the addition of EDTA, mercury will be combining with EDTA. And again, the supramolecular assembly is restored, giving back the switched off luminescence of the sensor. So that's all about the sensing of the mercury ion. And we tried anion sensing using the same unit, supramolecular assembly of graphene and rhodomine 60. And we screened a number of anions, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, you can see the list. And they are used in the form of either potassium or sodium salts. We selected such anions because this will not interfere in the analysis. And the observation is that fluoride ions are able to enhance the luminescence of congenital luminescence of the sensor unit. And another worthy, worthy thing is that the change in the luminescence is indicated under visible light also. You can see that visible noticing is enabled in presence of fluoride ions. So we can, we can usually detect whether fluoride ions are present in the solution. And picomolar level or PPT level detection was enabled by this. And the selectivity is given by this graph. Among this wider ion range, fluoride ions only respond in this manner. Now the relevance. Fluoride, fluoride ions are regarded as essential entity for healthy teeth and bone, but often the higher excess intake of fluoride in drinking water will lead to dental price and bone fluorosis, etc. And high exposure to fluoride ions will lead to oxidative stress damage to mitochondria, and which, which will result in neurodegenerative diseases. And as far as I know, fluoride poisoning is very uh, high in South India, especially in Tamil Nadu itself, in clinical areas. High toxicity of fluoride is reported, and studies are going on there in this direction. And the quantification, as previously mentioned, we could quantify fluoride in the picomolar level. And the limit of detection, the lowest amount that could be detected was found to be 44.7 picomolar. And here also we could make a solid state strip sensor using filter paper, which could detect fluoride ion in 950 parts per trillion, which comes around 50 picomolar amount. Now the real water sample analysis was done and what we did is we took fluoride ion and deliberately added the fluoride ions to tap water and well water and prepared fluoride containing solutions and we got we analyzed the amount of fluoride using this fluorometric technique and as you can see here in the, as in the result obtained the error percentage was found to be less than four percentage. And this assures that the detector or the sensor can perform well under complex real environments also 
for the detection of fluoride. Now you see our sensor or the supramolecular assembly, it can detect, it performs as a dual analyte sensor, which can detect both mercury as well as fluoride ions. Now generally a question will be there, how you can distinguish between these two ions. So for that we have an answer. If there is an enhancement in luminous sense of the sensor in presence of some ions, if we suspect as either HD2 positive or F negative, you treat the solution with EDTA or a stronger chelating agent. If it is a fluoride ion, we cannot see any change in the enhanced luminescence of the system. But on the other hand, if you have the mercury as the analyte molecule in the system, definitely the increased luminescence will be going in presence of EDTA. So you can differentiate between these two effectively. So that's all about the supramolecular assembly for fluoride and HD2 positive ion sensor. Now we have the part two of our discussion, graphene-based adsorbent. And here we have prepared graphene ion oxide tube nanocomposite. And ion oxide, as you know, it is an environmentally benign substance, which is abundant and has got low cost. And moreover, it is magnetic in nature so that we can easily make it mobile under the influence of a magnetic field. So here is the method of preparation, sulfate, sodium acetate as a reductant and graphene oxide, hydrothermal treatment, and followed by washing and calcination, cells in nanotubes combined with graphene. As you can see here, the SEM and TEM images, which shows that they, have, they are graphene and iron oxide nanotubes. And the phase was identified by XRD, which shows the nanotube and, sorry, iron oxide nanotube and carbon in it. And the magnetization shows that it is super paramagnetic in nature so that we can make or actuate the system mobile under the influence of a magnetic field. Then we tried for adsorption of some analytes. First, we tried heavy metal ions, chromium. Chromium is toxic and it is discharged to water bodies usually from the industries. And here I have given some images for a comparison. The first bottle, yellow one, is pure chromium. And the second one, chromium solution in contact with graphene and a magnet is kept in be near to it. And the third one is iron oxide in the solution. And the last one, this iron oxide nanocomposite of graphene. And you can see that at the last stage, that is with the iron oxide graphene composite, we can remove all the chromium to one side and you can easily uh, take it outside with an external magnet, magnetic movement. And this happened within one minute, 60 seconds it took for the observation. And the maximum adsorption capacity was found to be 106.38 milligram per gram. Then we took another analyte dye, methylene blue dye as the model. Here also same observation was obtained. Magnetic removal was achieved easily in 60 seconds where the maximum adsorption efficiency was 250 milligram per gram. Now we attributed to the synergistic effect of high surface area graphene and the magnetic property of iron oxide which enables Cell removal of the toxicants from the aqueous solution. Then it shows that recyclability shows that they are considerably recyclable for six cycles, both in the case of chromium as well as methylene blue dye. And the last part, we tried it for oil adsorption. And we are aware of the hazardous nature of oils in the sea. Oils, sunken ships, they'll be discharging. Oil spill will be there in the sea and it will be hazardous for the environment, both living as well as non-living organs, living organisms. And for an adsorbent to be an ideal oil adsorbent, it should be hydrophobic as well as oleophilic because we have to remove the oil from water. So the material should be hydrophobic and also it should have an affinity towards oleophilic. Here you can see the status of water on a hydrophilic surface where water will be spreading entirely on the surface. And if it's on a hydrophobic surface, water will bleed up on the surface with contact angle higher than 90. And if the contact angle is higher than 90, it's hydrophobic. And if it exceeds the value of 150 degree, we will get a super hydrophobic surface, which is very good for oil adsorption. And we used graphene iron oxide coated polyurethane foam sponge for oil removal. So polyurethane, as you know, it is a very light and porous framework and graphene it is a hydrophobic material which can impart hydrophobicity and iron oxide present in the system enables magnetic removal 
and also entertaining is that it adds roughness to the material. And roughness is an important factor that creates the hydrophobic factor because the rough surfaces they have tapped tire inside, and that will be pushing water outward and repelling water and increasing the hydrophobic nature. And this can be easily driven to the targets on you saying an external magnet and recyclability of the absorbent is greatly thus enhanced. This is the method of synthesis. We have the polyurethane form sponge here. Then immerse it in a dispersion of iron oxide, graphene oxide, ascorbic acid for 24 hours. Wash it and dry it under mild heating at 30 degrees. Then this is the final form of the polyurethane graphene iron oxide modified foam that we obtain sponge material. And this is the semi image which shows the porous nature of the material and also the surface has got considerable roughness due to the graphene and iron oxide composition. And our material, the material that we obtain is found to be hydrophobic and oleophilic as is usually demanded for a high, a good oil absorbing material. And this is the Im image of the sponge or foam where water and oil are dropped on the surface. You can see oil is completely penetrating into the material, whereas water is dealing on the top of it. This is scientifically tested using the contact angle measurement. Oil is having a zero degree contact angle, while water is having 158 degree contact angle. As already mentioned, it has become super hydrophobic as the contact angle is higher than 150 degrees. Then magnetic actuation or mobile, mobility under magnetic field is enabled. As you can see here, a magnet is used to make it mobile. The person is holding a magnet there and it is a sponge is standing, moving towards the magnet. And this is the experiment done in oil absorption. Here we have water in the beaker and we have got five gram of oil, which is colored in oil blue dye. So blue color represents the oil part. And we have the sponge or foam 80 milligram of sponge we took or the form polyurethane form we took and you can see that after 20 seconds almost all oil is removed from the water surface and then we took another material oil or organic compound chloroform which is denser and sink to bottom of the water here we have taken four gram of the chloroform which is dyed in blue and took the same amount of adsorbent form 80 milligram and the complete removal of the chloroform from water was affected in 10 seconds. It's a good result. And now we checked the adsorption efficiency of the polyurethane form towards various organics. And we took bean oil, lubricating oil, diesel oil, chloroform, toluene, DMSO, DMO, facetone, all these we checked. And we could see that the adsorption efficiency is, of the form is in the range 90 gram per gram to 316 gram per gram. A very good result for this type of adsorbents. Then we check the reusability. You took the material after adsorption, you simply skews of the oil from this foam, then use it again. And in the case of chloroform, successful application was enabled for 150 cycles without much loss in efficiency. And for the bean oil, we checked and we found that it can be reused for 120 cycles, over 120 cycles without, without much loss in efficiency. So it shows that it can be used as an excellent oil adsorbent from water. So to conclude, we have seen the formation of graphene rhodomin 60 supramolecular assembly, which would detect either mercury ion or fluoride ion, which very low concentrations of bicamolar level, which is and can be obtained under UV illumination and more specifically it is fluorescent spectroscopy as shown here. And we have prepared iron oxide nanotube hybrid, which is uh, efficient for adsorbing toxic pollutant from water, as evident from the cells of chromium and methylene blue adsorption. And finally, we have prepared a uh, form, polyurethane form modified by iron oxide and graphene, which is made hydrophobic by the deposition, which could perform well in oil adsorption. And I should thank my student, Anju M. She only did this, all these works. And finally, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Renita, madam, for your nice talk and enlightening us to uh, in the subject of graphene.
and uh, we will have definitely questions our viewers also will have questions and i think we can have discussion uh, over uh, mail and thank you for sparing your precious time and giving us uh, the your idea thanks a lot madam thank you ma'am now i invite dr g ramalingam professor to introduce the invited speaker 3 good morning to all first of all i would like to thank to the convener and com conveners to giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, professor c ramalingan the next speaker uh, respected registrar k sitaraman and dean of our faculty ramasamy sir and our hod padanayake madam and convener sashmita das co convener uh, sandeep kumar and uh, vidya sagar sir now i am introducing the next speaker uh, professor c ramalingam he is our uh, department of phd scholar he did his phd under professor s kabilan the year 2002 at presently he is working as a professor in the chemistry kalasilingam academic of research and education he has worked as a dean from june 2017 to september 21 and also as a dean freshman engineering from 2019 to till date the same institution and he has visited abroad as a visiting research professor at various countries especially for japan and republic of korea they a sponsor project undertaken dst serb 2013 to 2016 and csir project 2014 to 2017 and icmr 2016 to 2019 and also dbt project now 2020 to 2023 and he has guided many phd student as well as mphil scholars and regarding his contribution publication and patent he has granted one patent and filed three indian patents and regarding the publication he has published about 83 articles in international journals and he has awarded and recognition awarded research competitions award from 2016 to 2019 and also he is serving as a reviewer for more than 20 journals so this is a uh, now i invite professor c ramalingan to deliver his speech thank you thank you professor am i audible yes sir uh, is my slide visible ma'am ah uh, yes sir okay is my slides moving ah uh, yes sir yes okay thank you madam uh on the outset i would like to thank uh, the convener of this conference professor sashmita das and the co conveners uh, dr vidya sagar and dr sendil kumar for giving me an opportunity to speak a few words about the sensitized solar cell in this auspicious international conference on uh, surface chemistry Uh, 2422 uh, as we all know that an ability the energy is nothing but an ability of an object to do work and we all very well know that it's an important factor to influence the human society in the 21st century as we know if you want to uh, see a uh, beautiful fireworks and we want to drive in a beautiful road or if you want to you know uh, travel in a uh, aeroplanes or if you want to travel the nebula trains energy is needed that means the faster growth which requires uh, energy consumption 
And normally, a higher level of utilization of energy is required for the pro profitable development. And if you look into the countries like uh, you know the developed countries, normally the energy consumption at a huge rate. Uh, and uh, if you look into the basics of energy sources, and uh, it can be broadly classified into two categories: uh, primary source and secondary source. And secondary source it comes, you know, they are not the occurred in nature, but uh, it is derived from the primary sources. And the primary sources, they are occurred in nature, which can further be classified into renewable sources and non-renewable sources. And in the world, we use uh, the non-renewable sources of 84% approximately, whereas the renewable sources only 16%. The examples which include oh, child, solar, and wood energy, as far as the non-renewable energies are concerned, it's called petroleum, natural gas, and nuclear energy. And uh, Uh, if you look into the fossil fuels, is fossil fuels hazardous? Yes, the picture itself shows it's uh, highly hazardous. So normally we look into the alternative energy sources. So what are the other energy sources are essential? The major preferences would be uh, around the globe would be the fossil fuel with minimized pollution, nuclear power, and the renewable energy. And if you look into the fossil fuel with minimized pollution, uh, normally you know a safe storage of 25 billion of metric, metric tons of carbon dioxide in a year is required to harvest about 10 terawatt energy and if you look into the nuclear power to become an alternative of course a new plant with one gigawatt energy production per day for another 50 years is required uh, this is just you know if you look into this it's an impractical one and also the uh, production of radioactive material is another environment to worry about this and what are the other one? What are the other types of renewable energies? Hydropower, of course, hydropower is an essential one. But if you look into the drawbacks associated with this hydropower is the expensiveness uh, of this uh, hydropower production. And wind energy, yes, of course, this also a renewable energy source. But you know, as, you, as far as the wind energy is concerned, the speed of the wind increases and the power output will also increase. And uh, no doubt, if there is no fuel costs required for the production, production of the wind energy. Uh, that is the benefit. Uh, the, the wind power is, 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 is almost uh, stable when compared with other energy sources. Whereas, if you look into the disadvantage of this wind energy, the, the normally the power obtained from wind is inconsistent because we cannot get the wind energy throughout the year in all the places. It is region specific and also the seasonal specific. And uh, the biomass and biofuel fuels, it's nothing but a biomass, which is, you know, uh, 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 which is achieved from uh, recently lived organisms or living organisms, which is nothing but a biologically resulted material. Uh, there are you know, direct burning of biomass and indirect conversion of biomass to some of the, uh, some form of fuels. This is what we call it as biofuels. And the major biomass energy source is always wood. And if you look into the biofuels, the bioethanol and biodiesel, these are all the liquid biofuels and there is biogas, uh, you know, this falls in the category of biofuel also. And the other uh, renewable energy is geothermal energy. Yes, uh, the thermal energy which is produced and stored in the earth, what we call it as uh, geothermal energy. In spite of all these energy sources, uh, development of I mean, green energy, I mean, uh, the renewable energy sources, the development of green and clean technologies is always I mean, uh, essential and uh, in advanced level is essential to meet the global needs of the energy. And if you look into the solar energy, of course, the you know, sun plays a crucial role as the source of future energy because it's a solar energy source. And uh, normally, you know, the Earth's surface, the Earth's surface, we obtain around approximately 3 uh, into 10 to the power 24 joules per year in the form of sunlight. So this energy is approximately 10 to the power of four times greater than the energy utilization of the world. So since this energy is provided by only sun, and also throughout the year, especially the countries like India, uh, unlike the uh, developed countries like United States or Japan or uh, uh, Germany, where you know for six months you won't be having uh, uh, sunlight, whereas the, we are very fortunate to have sunlight throughout the year. So, since this sun provides this energy, and also throughout the year, it is highly essential to devise the practical approaches for the conversion, storage, and uh, distribution of this particular energy. And if you look at the brief of uh, history of the solar cells, the solar cells normally which convert the sunlight directly into the electricity and the photovoltaic effect. In 1839, the, the scientist called Becquerel was the first who is recognized the uh, photovoltaic effect. And later on in 1880s, the Fritz, uh, who created the first device made up of selenium vapors with the power conversion efficiency of 1%. And after that, an intensive research for the efficient photovoltaics has been ongoing around the globe. 
uh, in 1950s from Bell Laboratories, Chapin et al, who have improved the power conversion efficiency of silicon cell to a 6%. And if you look at the photovoltaic generations, are broadly classified into three categories, the first, second, and third generation solar cells. And the first generation solar cells are nothing but uh, the silicon-based solar cells. And uh, no doubt, it provides a super superior efficiency with high cost production. And it occupied the entire commercial market till today. And if you look at the second generation solar cells, uh, normally the thin film based solar cells are called as second generation solar cells. Uh, these second generation solar cells are though they are economic, uh, they provide lower efficiency. And the third generation solar cells, any cells which are not falling under the categories of above two first and second generation solar cells, we call it as third generation solar cells. And most of the solar cells belongs to the third generation are yet to be commercialized, commercially realized. However, a numerous research has been going around the globe. So the Dyson today solar cells, which falls under the category of third generation solar cells. And if you see the history of Dyson today solar cells, you know, uh, since late 1960s, the generation of electricity from dyes is known. And the initial attempt for the electricity generation from the dye sensitized semiconductor was from the zinc oxide sensitized uh, on uh, the chlorophyll, which is uh, called as a natural based dye. In 80, 1980s, the first picture of a recent dye design solar cell was emerged. And, but a great a breakthrough has been happened in the 1991s after the discovery of great cells, ruthenium based dye in the, the field of uh, dye sensitized solar cells. Uh, he has published a paper in Nature in 1991. Uh, after that nature paper, uh, the researchers around the globe have been intensively working on the disensitized solar cells. And he, he made that it was, it was established in his institution that the disensitized solar cells can be a practicable source of alternative energy. So he obtained the ruthenium incorporated disensitized solar cells for the power conversion efficiency of 11.5%. And later, he, his group uh, modified with the zinc processing dye and uh, the, co the uh, you know, cobalt based electrolyte. Uh, and, and they were able to improve the power conversion efficiency 12%. And, and later on, uh, a, a scientist, a group from the China, they have improved the power conversion efficiency to 15% based on the pyrrhine based dyes. And what are the advantages of uh, dye sensitized solar cells? Of course, the dye sensitized solar cells' power conversion efficiency are not superior than the first and second generations, whereas uh, it has some advantages. In, this, in the case of dye sensitized solar cells, you know, it is temperature independent. You know, you can have 25 to 65 degrees centigrade, and especially, you know, in places where the temperature changes happens uh, from season to season. So this is, uh, you know, quite independent to the temperature. Whereas if you look into the uh, silicon-based solar cells, uh, an approximately of 20% uh, energy is reduced, fraction is reduced. And the efficiency is better in cloudy conditions also uh, compared to silicon-based solar cells. Uh, then sensitivity, sensitiveness of the incident angle to irradiation uh, uh, of light is less, you know, uh, otherwise you, you need to have the solar panel in the right angles to each other, uh, right angles to the uh, sunlight. But here it is not uh, much sensitive to the uh, uh, incident light so that, you know, moving of the solar panel can be reduced. And uh, it can be expected, of course, to be cost effective and advantageous. And uh, in this case, the purification steps like uh, you know, high vacuum uh, technologies are not required. And uh, this technology can also be adopted to the you know, extended up to the terawatt because you know, here the material supply is no, uh, it's not an early problem because the sun is the source of material. And uh, if you look into the synthetic point of view, this is the, uh, it can be classified two, into two types so in the functional ruthenium two polyproteal complexes and the metal free organic dyes, uh, donor acceptor dyes. So these are the dyes which have been synthesized and uh, applied as a since I mean synthesizer by the uh, group of uh, Gratchen, and the second one is battery organic dyes, and then if you look into the operation principle of uh, uh, this dye synthesized uh, solar cells, you know we, we have uh, three, five important components here: the photoanode, the semiconductor metal oxide film, synthesizer, electrolyte, and uh, counter electrode. Uh, at the heart of the system is a mesoporous oxide layer, as you can see here, this titanium dioxide, the material of choice normally. And uh, there are so many other materials that have also been used. And attached to the surface of the film is the monolayer of the charge transfer dye. Uh, we, uh, being an organic chemist, we focus mainly on the uh, synthesis of the dyes with uh, various uh, acceptor groups to graft on the semiconductor surfaces. And, uh, the photo excitation of the dye results in the injection of an electron into the conduction band of the uh, in the oxide layer. 
And then the original state of the dye is subsequently restored by electron donation from the electrolyte. Uh, normally, you know, when organic solvent, uh, which containing the redox system, like iodine and triiodide, we have used here as an electrolyte system. And uh, the regeneration of the synthesizer by iodine intercepts the recapture of the uh, conduction band electrons by the oxide, the oxidized dye. So the iodine is regenerated in turn by the reduction of this iodine triiodide couple and uh, thereby it regenerates the dye. So overall, the device uh, generates electric power from light without suffering any permanent uh, damage. And if you look into the international status, uh, these, dyes, these are the important scientists who have done a significant contribution in the dye sensitized solar cell world. That's uh, Michael Bratchell. This is the first one is the, uh, Michael Bratchell from Nikola Polytechnic, Professor Kojiro Hara from uh, AIST, Professor Lee Chung San from uh, uh, RIT, and Professor Koje Jong from uh, Korea University. And also Professor uh, Jetelin and James Durant, Anders Eckfeld, Mario Narak, and Kichia. These are some of the notable scientific personalities who have done a significant contribution in the area of dyson day solar cells. And also some of the multinational industries uh, which involved in a DSSC research on the Sony, Dyson, Sujikura, Solonics. There are a number of industries who have been, who have been either producing the Dyson I mean, solar cells, uh, solar energy, or producing the materials for the uh, solar energy harvesting. And if you look into the national status of, uh, you know, for the, the Dyson State Solar Cell, particularly in India, uh, I would like to point out this, the Professor Michael Bratchell, who was the winner of the 2010 Millennium Technology Prize, which is supposed to be the uh, next to the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, name of the prize. And when he was uh, receiving this prize, uh, he pointed out that India will stand significantly to gain from us new technology on solar power, because it is a cheap, green, and efficient. And he's particularly interested in India. He then added while uh, receiving this uh, prize in the, uh, uh, during uh, 2010. And also uh, the solar cooling will immensely, when he was giving uh, uh, an interview to the INS, he, saw, he told that solar energy cooling will immensely help India as refrigeration is directly related to health issues. And uh, if you look into the Indian scenario, a couple of major issues in India, Electricity, of course. Uh, very uh, recently, you know, we had a lot of power shutdown, and now it is comparatively is okay. But still, there are many places uh, we are uh, we are in need of uh, you know, huge electricity. We we have uh, rural areas, a lot of uh, rural areas, and another important thing is the cost of petrol. It is increasing like anything every day, and we know everybody. So, solar cells can provide solution for the above, along with uh, water purification and uh, etc. So we have been uh, concentrating on the organic dyes in dye sensitized solar cells. Normally, you know, the general structural core of uh, the organic dyes, which has the spacer, donor, and acceptor. Uh, the, the donors can push the electrons through the spacer and acceptor. Uh, we must have uh, an acceptor will uh, graft on the semiconductor surface. Uh, and this, you know, the advantages of using the organic dyes, normally, you know, to devise the molecular architecture the revising the molecular architecture is comparatively easy when compared with the organometallics. And uh, uh, since it is an organic molecule, we can conveniently design and synthesize. And uh, they are superior to noble metal complexes if you look into the environmental and cost issues are concerned. And also the, to tune the absorption over a broad spectral range and to achieve the high power conversion if I mean uh, epsilon uh, molar extinction coefficient, uh, different light absorbing groups can be uh, incorporated into the organic framework. Whereas if you look into the organic metallics, it is a bit difficult. And the designing principle uh, for the an ideal sensitizer, normally a sensitizer must be having at least one anchoring group, uh, which has to graft on the semiconducting, sub semiconducting surfaces. And uh, the LUMO of the dye must be upper than the conduction band of semiconductor. And similarly, the home of the dye must be lower than the flux potential of the electrolyte. The molar extinction coefficient of the dye must be higher than the sunlight's uh, wide range in order to obtain high uh, harvesting, light harvesting uh, efficiency. And uh, the dyes must be, of course, chemically stable to get a long durability. And also the dye must be structurally designed by, by having the hydrophobic and bulky groups and in order to inhibit the 
aggregation of the dyes uh, when we are uh, crafting on the semiconducting surfaces. And as far as the organic uh, molecules are concerned, there are uh, various types of organic uh, family uh, are uh, incorporated in synthesizing the various dyes by the researchers around the globe. So some of uh, them are included here, which is tetrahydrocanolins, fluorine, carbazole, cumarin, hemithionine, anthraquinone, indoline, pyrrhylin, and so on. A wide range of uh, you know, structural motifs have been utilized for the synthesis of a new uh, novel organic dyes as an efficient synthesizer in the dye synthesis on our cells. And we have been concentrated on uh, phenothiazin based dye synthesis on our cells. Why we are interested in phenothiazin? Uh, if you look into the, the structural core of phenothiazin, which is non planar, which has the butterfly conformation, uh, this conformation can hamper the aggregation as well as the formation of molecular excimers. And uh, the electron richness, because of the presence of sulfur and nitrogen, uh, this makes the phenothiazin an efficient donor. And also, this can act as a, when a spacer come donor. And the large pi conjugate system, you have a few rings. So, a larger pi conjugate system, it has. So, the phenothiazins play a major role in dye synthesis all our cells. And if you look into the brief history of phenothiazin, uh, here the phenothiazin core is acting as an electron donor and the uh, you know, cyanocrylic acid and rhodonine acidic acid were used uh, as an electron acceptor. And also, this, these uh, 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 rhodonine acidic acid and also the cyanocrylic acid functional groups are used to graft on the semiconducting surfaces so that the electron transfer from the, uh, uh, the dye uh, after absorption, the dye to the semiconducting surface is facile. And this was uh, you know, discovered in, by Sun et al. in 2007. Uh, they obtained the power conversion efficiency of about 5.5%. 5, 5 and based uh, on this, uh, uh, these couple of molecules, we, uh, when I was in uh, Korea, we have been uh, synthesized, uh, we have been designed the molecules, which, which is integrated with uh, phenothiazin and also with the carbazoles. And uh, uh, the carbazoles will serve as an electron donor. And here the phenothiazin uh, can serve as an electron donor as well as the spacer and the rhodonine acetic acid uh, serve as an electron acceptor. Here we have synthesized these molecules by adopting multi-step synthetic strategies. Uh, right from the phenothiazin, commercially available phenothiazin by applying alkylation, wilsmer hack reaction, halogenation, and the other side, the phenothiazin, I mean, the carbazole with the halogenation, and then uh, uh, an aboration uh, followed by uh, Suzuki coupling, and then the Novinagel type reaction. So, multi step synthetic strategies have been adopted to synthesize this molecule. Uh, similarly, with varying uh, uh, the substituents at the end part of uh, phenothiazin and as well as the Carbazole and also the, the various form, various uh, you know uh, the uh, electron accepting molecules, and we synthesize these molecules. And also, we thought of integra integrating uh, uh, the phenothiazin with uh, amine amine uh, structural motifs to 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 release the electrons from the uh, rear side. And also, we use the cyanocrylic acid as an electron acceptor as well as the, the grafting material. And we synthesized various molecules with the diverse substituents. And after completing this, after spending two, two and a half years almost, uh, and similarly here also, we just twisted between the uh, you know carbazole and phenothiazin. As you can see here, here the phenothiazin is in the uh, peripheral position and the carbazole in the uh, middle position, which serves as the electron donor as well as the uh, spacer. And uh, we just interchange the uh, carbazole as well as the you know, thiazine in here. And similar to the earlier cases, we used rhodonine acetic acid and uh, uh, cyanoacetic acid. Uh, we we obtained the, mo uh, the highest molecule. Uh, I mean, the, the molecule with higher highest power conversion efficiency was identified as the N N Xl substituted molecule. And when we were writing the paper, and unfortunately, the, the same work was uh, published by Kao et al. in dyes and pigments. So we had no other choice. We left the work there. And later on, while, uh, while synthesizing these molecules, uh, being an organic chemist, we developed a couple of methods, I mean, a method for the uh, eventual step of Novinagel reaction for the synthesis of dyes. So well, we thought of uh, since, uh, you know, using some different methods for the, uh, the, you know, for the synthetic methodology for this. And in that case, we have synthesized a mechanochemical approach for this molecule 
and which are, we have since uh, we have published in uh, Catalyst later and after joining this uh, Kalasaringam Academy of Research and Education. And uh, similarly, you know, a uh, uh, green methodology we have uh, since we developed for the catalyst free conditions for this and the mechanistic, uh, uh, the possible mechanism for the uh, this Navinagal reaction has been uh, published in uh, Singlet. And similarly, we have developed another Navinagal reaction with uh, you know, amides also. So, but in the previous cases, it is uh, you know, acryl nitriles and the you know, ethyl uh, uh, acetate based uh, molecules. And the free amino groups, we could not be able to make it in that. So, these molecules we used for uh, the further functionalization because of the free NH2 group. So, in our uh, extension of this reaction, we have uh, achieved this also. And this paper has been published in Chattery in Lera. And while uh, doing the synthesis of those dyes, uh, we, we were trying to crystallize uh, at least any one of the dyes, but unfortunately we could not be able to do that. And uh, but uh, fortunately we could able to synthesize the, I mean, the crystallize the dye. I mean, the precursor of the dyes. So these are a couple of examples which we have published in JMC, uh, JMS uh, in 2017, and also these are other uh, couple of uh, you know the intermediates. That is the precursor of the final uh, the product. And these are published in JMC and JMS uh, molecules. And here uh, we have synthesized now, we, we, we thought of uh, in, in the earlier case, we have uh, introduced the uh, uh, carbazole and uh, the amino groups in the peripheral part of the sixth position of the phenothiazine. Now we thought of introducing, incorporating these, uh, uh, I mean, carbazoles in the end position of the phenothiazine. Uh, this after coming to this uh, you know, Kalasalingam Academy of Research and Education, uh, we have started within my, in my group. And uh, using this uh, I mean, uh, the cyanoacrylic acid as the uh, electron acceptor, and similarly, uh, we're changing the various, uh, as you can see here, various substituents here, various chain lengths and various uh, uh, don't, I mean, acceptor groups. And eventually, we found that uh, we found uh, that the molecule which possesses n-butyl substituent at the uh, carbazole, which has the power conversion efficiency of 8.8 percent, and which has been published in uh, physical chemistry and chemical physics, and also we thought of uh, sterically congested carbazole motifs decorated phenothiazine to incorporate here in this phenothiazine. Uh, in this phenothiazine, you can see here. Uh, we have introduced a uh, carbazole with a uh, sterically congested uh, tertiary butyl group in the uh, three and six position of the carbazoles. And here also, as you know, this multi step synthetic strategy. And uh, we have synthesized with uh, uh, using the uh, rhodon and acetic acid as the uh, acceptor. And these molecules, uh, and also a further incorporation of the uh, the uh, carbazole structural unit to make uh, more sterically congested molecules here. As you can see here, in the previous case, we have used only uh, one uh, carbazole unit and here three carbazole units by you know, multi-step synthetic strategy. Here it's a phenothiazine and here it's carbazole and here uh, both are the other two carbazoles as the electron donors. And the, here the, the middle carbazole and the phenothiazine can serve as electron donor as well as the spacer. And uh, we could be able to obtain a molecule uh, with only 4.3% of power conversion efficiency with uh, the NS butyl substituent on the phenothiazine core. And later on, we thought of in, in, uh, replacing this uh, uh, rhodonine acetic acid by the uh, cyanoacrylic acid in the uh, mono uh, carbazole integrated molecule, uh, phenothiazine based molecules. And uh, we synthesized these molecules. And similarly, the multi, the three carbazole integrated molecule also with the inter incorporation of uh, cyanoacrylic acid. So the replacing the uh, rhodonine acetic acid by the cyanoacrylic acid, which can improve the power conversion efficiency up to the 8%. That means the, the, the crafting of the uh, cyanoacrylic acid over the titanium surface is more efficient than the uh, rhodonine acetic acid. As a result, the uh, you know, electron good electron transfer from the uh, of dye to the conduction band of the semiconductor uh, happens. So this we, we, we could able to improve from 4% to 8% by using this uh, multiple uh, cyanoacrylic acid as the 
accept our molecule and this paper has been published in electrochemical act in 2017 and then we thought of incorporating instead of a uh, 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 carbazole unit, we have, in, in, we have uh, introduced the fluorines with uh, multiple alkyl substituents because the alkyl substituents are essential to, uh, for the uh, you know, solubility. Uh, as you know, it is even the, the length of the chain increases, the solubility also increases and also you know, uh, to make the uh, uh, surface hydrophobic, it's, it is required and we integrated uh, the theorem in uh, uh, here, you know, the phenothiazine, and here we have integrated with the uh, fluorine units. And again, uh, we have inter introduced the rhodonine acetic acid as well as the uh, cyanoacrylic acid as the uh, grafting materials. And uh, we could be able to prime the molecule, uh, the most efficient molecule with the eight percent with the power of the fluorine molecule with the ethyl substituent, diethyl substituent on the fluorine unit. Right substituent on the fluorine unit can uh, improve the power conversion efficiency to 8% in this case. And this paper has been published in Electrochemical Act in 2018. And after that, we thought of integrating uh, with the various other molecules, that is the various anchoring groups here, and also various, uh, you know, pyran scaffold, uh, incorporation of pyran scaffold in, in place of phenothiazine, and also the Fused thiazine structural motif in the two sides, as well as the azofluorine structural unit, and uh, of course with the various alkyl substituents. And in this case, we have synthesized more than uh, five diverse uh, uh, categories of molecules. And uh, because of this past couple of years, because of the pandemic, we were not able to complete the process. And as you know, uh, it, it involves the extensive uh, synthetic uh, aspects here. Uh, so we could not be able to uh, complete because of the pandemic and uh, this fabrication process uh, by now, actually we have uh, completed the synthetic process and the fabrication process are uh, under progress. So what are the future prospects of this? It is an important one. I know the further study of structural property correlation between power conversion efficiency and stability, which facilitate the Dyson space for our cell technology in a wider use. And the number of factors which are determining the power conversion efficiency has to be solved because it is not yet to be solved. It is very clear from the uh, literature that you can see from uh, the from 1991 to till date that is it is not clear that the number of factors which determines the power conversion efficiency. So it is very very important to uh, determine the power conversion efficiency, the number of factors. And also, if you look into the, uh, the geometric and electronic structure of the dice. Which plays a power and you know, play a vital role as far as the synthetic chemistry point of view. Uh, you know, uh, depending on the needs, we need to integrate the structural required structural components over here, and uh, it is possible to design more sophisticated die. I mean, die structures that satisfy the needs of uh, DSS technology. Uh, when we uh, consider all these the above factors, therefore, the development of conceptually new, I mean, design for the uh, new design for the constructing organic dyes is a very, very important and an urgent challenge for the uh, scientific community uh, around the world. Uh, so since we have given a very short time, uh, I, would, I, I was uh, uh, trying to complete it on time. So my research group is uh, working on the design and synthesis of novel cycles of biological importance, neurology development, organic synthesis. Asymmetric catalysis and uh, the design of new dyes for dyson dye solar cells. And this is my research group. And uh, these two are uh, the students who are responsible, uh, who are uh, uh, mainly involved in this uh, work. This is uh, Dr. Karvasami, now he is a postdoctoral fellow at, in China. And he is Dr. Stalin Dure, is a postdoctoral fellow in Taiwan. And I would like to sincerely thank uh, the DST, CSIR, ICMR, and also DBT for their financial assistance, because as you know, without finance, we cannot do and especially when we do organic synthesis, and it is highly essential. So uh, I thank uh, the, all the funding agencies for uh, financial assistance to carry out this work. And uh, and uh, let me uh, let, let me a little brief about my institution. My institution is Kalasalingam Academy of Research and Education, which is uh, located in the southern part of Tamil Nadu, which is uh, Sri Putru, as you know, the Andal Temple very famous in the world 
and uh, we are uh, a grade institution a nac nac by grade by nac and uh, we stood 50th rank under the university category and 56th rank under engineering category and 74th under overall category and 11 of our departments are accredited by abet accredited board of uh, engineering technology uh, united states and uh, recently we ranked among top 25 in the atl ranking of uh, institutions on innovations uh, achievements in the year 2020 and also if you look at the green metric we are second among indian universities in 2020 and also uh, seven of our departments are mba accredited and there are uh, so many things and i would like to thank my institution also for giving me this chance to present this work in this auspicious occasion so once again i thank uh, Professor Sashmita Das for giving me an opportunity to share a few things. So the time is very short. I would able, I was I hope I could able to complete a few things in this. And uh, I thank the co-conveners and the uh, institution, uh, Anamali University. And also there are so many my professors and my friends are there. So I, I take this opportunity to thank one and all and also for the participants. Uh, thanks for giving in this opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramalingan, for your uh, nice talk on uh, dye sensitization. And uh, being an alumnus, uh, our uh, research scholars also uh, had a direct interaction with you. And I hope uh, they would have been uh, sensitized by your talk. And um, uh, maybe in the uh, future, uh, I will ask them to contact you regarding this kind of uh, um, problems. And uh, today for lack of time, we are not able to go, in, uh, go to the question session. So anyway, we will be in touch and uh, through email, we can ask the students to contact you and uh, get to know whatever doubts they have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Now I invite Dr. S. Palamalai, Professor, Department of Chemistry, Annamalai University, to introduce our invited speaker for. Good afternoon to all. First of all, let me thank uh, Professor Sashmita Das for giving me this opportunity. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Auzam Razi, who's at present working as as a professor of inorganic chemistry, Department of Chemistry, American University of Beirut, Lebanon. Lebanon is a country in the Middle East, even though Saras uh, at present working in uh, Lebanon is a product of uh, France. Actually, Sar uh, who completed PG and uh, PhD in the university Cloud Bernard, which is, which is actually located in France. Saras has more than 20 years of uh, teaching and uh, research experience. If you look the list of uh, the institutions Sar worked out, where Sar was uh, working, is amazing. Different institute, all the all the are uh, well listed in the uh, ranking. Then, if you uh, go through the expertise list, is lengthy. I'm not able to read all because uh, such a all-round uh, performance in chemistry is uh, remote almost. Sarah's uh, at present teaching in organic, but expert physical chemistry, material science, material chemistry, surface chemistry, absorption and uh, physical chemistry, then including biocatalysis, such a wider range of uh, experience is uh, with the side. So I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm delighted to introduce such a uh, huge personality. If you go through the uh, professional activities of uh, our professor Azam Razi, Sar is member of uh, the editorial board for scientific uh, reports, which is uh, uh, from Nature, Nature Research Group. Sar also is a technical expert at the Lebanese Ministry of education and higher education. If you go through the referee list, a huge list uh, I have in my hand, SAR is almost uh, uh, 20 numbers. In 20 numbers of journal, SAR is uh, working as a referee, including ACS, uh, Taylor and Francis, elsewhere, 
Springer, etc. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, if I look uh, the list of publications, all they are alighted. Sarah so more than uh, uh, 50 uh, research papers. Uh, Sarah so having with a uh, citation of uh, 2147 with the Hatch Index uh, 21. So Sarah so with a uh, fantastic uh, career uh, in his biodata. Uh, so let, uh, let us all uh, be prepared to get advancement in the topic of uh, curcumin loaded metal oxide aerogels. Let me welcome Dr. Hazam Prazi to give his lecture. Thank you, sir, for this uh, introduction. May I share my screen? Yes, sir. Share your screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, Thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. And uh, also I'd like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to be part of this, of this very nice event. So today uh, I'll be talking about the curcumin loaded metal oxide aerogels. And uh, for those who are not very familiar with aerogels, let me start talking about these materials. Uh, these materials are known to be very or highly porous materials and among the, the, uh, the, the most porous materials on earth, synthetic materials on earth. Uh, although now we have a broad range of, uh, of aerogels, these materials were synthesized for the first time in 1931 by Samuel Kistler, who prepared these materials by bringing the liquid that exists inside the pores of, port of these porous materials to a supercritical condition. And this way, once you bring the liquid that exists in the pores to a supercritical condition, at that point, you can reduce the pressure without making any leak or condensation of the liquid inside the pores. And this way, you, uh, uh, you, uh, you go from or you can get rid of the liquid without passing through this boundary, this liquid gas boundary. So this prevents any type of liquid from or any type from ga of gas from being recondensed inside the pores. And this might cause the, uh, the, the cracking of the pores and create some uh, capillary stress inside the pores. These aerogels or the ones that I will be talking about, they fall under the class of sol gel materials. And if I wanna summarize quickly, what are what is this whole gel process? It's made of steps where we start from a colloidal suspension, where this suspension is a phase where we have small particles that are existing in the medium. And then after uh, condensation, uh, they will go into a sol. And this is, this is the, the, the technical word of this colloidal suspension where particles are existing in liquids. And then after gelation, they create a gel. And within this gel, we have a liquid that is filling the pores. That's why the idea is to get rid of this, of this liquid without, pre, without getting any stress on the pores and making them to crack and to shrink. If I go back to the process in, in general, it starts with a solution of precursors. These precursors are mainly inorganic, although the sol gel process could be applied also for organic species, but here in this my, in, in my presentation, I will be limiting it to the inorganic part. So starting from a solution of precursors, after condensation, they will make the sol that I mentioned earlier. This sol could be used in different ways. Either we can put it on a surface by, spray, um, by spraying the material on the surface or by coating, either by spin coating or by dip coating in order to get a liquid that can be densified to make a thin film, or we can draw these salts to make fibers, or we can simply dry them to get powders. What is important for me is when they gel. After gelation, they create a network. And this network, as I said earlier, it's filled with liquid. Now, 
if when I put something inside this network, or if when I use the surface of this network, so the surface of this material for specific chemical reactions, we need to get rid of this liquid. One simple way to do it is by simple evaporation. And this evaporation makes what is known by the xero gel. The xero in Greek means dense. So here we have a dense gel where the porosity is almost negligible because all the liquid went out and all the pores shrinked. And this makes the aerogels. What I'm interested in is how to get rid of this, li of this liquid without shrinking the pores. And this can be done by supercritical drying, the, the technique that I mentioned earlier, to get the materials known by aerogel. These aerogels could be used as they are, or they can be centered in order to get dense ceramics. If I go back to this supercritical drying technique, as I mentioned earlier, when I get rid of the liquid without going through this liquid gas boundary, because this is where the capillary stress exists. And by evaporation of the liquid from the pores, the pores will crack. And this way we lose the porosity of the material. To do that, we can use a liquid. To do the supercritical uh, uh, drying technique, we can use a liquid. And this liquid could be anything. However, we selected to use the carbon dioxide, which, is, which has a critical point at low temperature, so 31.1 degrees Celsius, and the critical pressure around 74 bar. If we compare this to methanol, it's much less. And that's why carbon dioxide is widely used whenever we have um, materials which are heat sensitive or whenever we are using biomolecules within, within this network. Over the years, plenty of work has been done on aerogels. Plenty of oxide materials were prepared. Here I'm showing you some examples of yttrium oxide. This is how it appears. We can prepare it in different, different sizes, different scales. And this is what is the transmission electron microscopy image of an yttrium oxide aerogel. This is a silica material, for example. And you can see that for both of them, we have, um, we have a, a network that is made of something like pearls. So that's why we talk about string of pearls. And these pearls are made of secondary particles. If we go deep into these uh, structures and try to, to understand what these secondary particles are made of, we can see that each one of them is made of primary particles. And if we even we go in, inside these primary particles, we see that we have the network, the silicon network that I was, the silicon, if I'm talking about silicon here, or anything else where we have these bonds, S-I-O-S-I -S -I or E-Y-O-Y -Y or any other uh, oxide network. The sizes of these particles are somehow small, five to 10, nanometers for these um, uh, secondary particles. By looking at the applications of the aerogels, these were used in different applications, mainly by the NASA, which are using these, mar these materials for dust collection. So whenever they, they send ships in space, they put some aerogel collector here. So you can see here, this is the collector, which, is, which looks like this. And inside these aerogels, they collect the dust that is available in the space. And then they get rid of the network, of the inorganic network, and they collect the dust to analyze it. This is how they are collecting a part of the dust in space. But this is not the only way or the only application for these aerogels. The industry is using the aerogels because of their insulating properties, for instance. Here you can see the famous champion which are making the zero loft uh, jackets. So here we have the pyrogel material, which is also used for insulation. You can have them in different forms, like that, for instance. Also these materials, because of their very interesting optical properties, they were used in windows. And here we have, we can see this dome, which is made of aerogel material, used because, as I said, for their optical properties. Although these materials, since I said, I started saying they are highly porous materials, they are known to be the lightest material on earth. So they, 
the, the density of the lightest of these materials can go to something like 0 0.003 gram per cubic centimeter. So it's extremely low. That's why they are used in sport applications. Here we have a racket, tennis racket, which is made, which is which includes inside some aerogel. And you can see it's written here, aerogel. So Dunlop, this is Dunlop, for instance. So Dunlop used these Dunlop aerogel rackets because of their lightweight. Although we have plenty of applications for these materials, however, what I'm interested in is their applications in chemistry and more specifically in catalysis and in water treatment. Here I'm showing you some of our previous work in the last few years. We went over different projects and we prepared, for instance, hybrid silica polyacrylamide aerogels and, and, and xerogels, and we used them for water remediation. So we used them for the absorption of mercury from water. We prepared nano-cobalt ferrite aerogels, and we used them for catalysis for a specific reaction, which is shown here. Also, we functionalized the surface of the silica aerogels to use them as, um, as hosts for polyoxylmetallates. So we immobilized, we immobilized and entrapped polyxometallates onto silica and titanium aerogels, and we tested their catalytic activity, how the presence of the inorganic network enhances the activity of this inorganic cluster. Also, we prepared silica and, or we tested silica and titanium aerogels for water treatment. So these materials were never used for water treatment like the adsorption of organic dyes or the adsorption of toxic metals. So we tested them for the adsorption of dyes. Here we have an azo dye on, on titania. For, um, for the silica, we tested it for different types of, of organic molecules, including the methylene blue. Also, we prepared nickel alumina oxide aerogels and we tested them for the adsorption of, of azo dyes, so for water treatment. Very recently, also we test we, we we investigated the possibility of using these silica aerogels as molecular imprinting materials. So where we have put a molecule as a template, then we removed it from the porosity of the material, and then we tested the material and checked its, its selectivity towards this specific molecule and other similar similar molecules. So this was the first molecularly imprinted aerogels. Um, ever published. Also, we, test, we use these materials for catalysis and more specifically for, the, uh, for biodiesel production. So we used calcium oxide and aluminum oxide aerogels for biodiesel production. So you can see from this wide spectrum that we're not limiting our work to one specific metal oxide. However, we are covering a very broad range of metal oxides for their use as, as catalysts, as, uh, sorry, um, as aerogels for catalysis and for water treatment. In the current work, I will be interested, I will be talking about one of our very recent work, which was the, uh, the uh, loading of, silic of aerogels, several types of oxide aerogels with curcumin. Curcumin, which is a molecule, which is a polyphenol, and that is this IUPAC name. It's a molecule that has several benefits in medical applications, mainly because it's known to be an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory molecule. But this molecule also is used for fluorescence probing and for sensing applications. Recent works have shown that these materials can be encapsulated or entrapped within different structures. I'm showing you then some examples of this. In liposomes, for example, my collaborator on this work, Dr. Digambara Patra, was succeeded uh, in, in encapsulating the curcumin in different types of liposomes. A different work was done where curcumin was entrapped also in emulsions. In microgels, for instance, here, this work, showed how the curcumin was entrapped in microgels or in discoidal polymeric particles here. Also, 
in, in recent years, some organic aerogels were used for the entrapment of, of, um, of curcumin. And here are two of the very recent works that were published uh, where curcumin was entrapped in chitosan aerogel and in pectin aerogel. The current work addresses the entrapment or the loading of curcumin within metal oxide aerogels, so within inorganic aerogels. And this is something that was never tested. So aerogels, metal oxide aerogels were never used for the entrapment of curcumin. So we tried to understand how this material will behave in the presence of curcumin and if the organic molecule will be stable within this type of structure. This work was recently published in RSC Advances in 2021. To prepare the materials, we went through a very simple technique where we mixed our precursors, the metal salt, because we started with different type of metals and I will be talk about, talking about these metals later on. We mixed them with methanol, with curcumin and with propylene oxide if needed. Simply by mixing these together and keeping them for rest, for gelation within 24 hours, we can get a solid material, which is a gel. The problem here is that these gels are, are filled with methanol and water in, if used. So the problem of methanol is that it's not miscible with a carbon dioxide, with a liquid carbon dioxide. For that reason, we had to go through a, an intermediate step, which is an exchange of the methanol that exists inside the pores of these materials with acetone that shows much higher miscibility with the carbon, with the liquid carbon dioxide. Later on, we dried these gels using the carbon dioxide supercritical drying technique in order to get the various types of, of aerogels. In this picture, picture you, can you can see what types of, of oxides we used. We used silicon oxide, titanium oxide, dysprosium, samarium, erbium, neodymium, cobalt iron, iron, and holmium. So different types of aerogels. And you can see how they are compared whenever the materials are used pure, so without the curcumin, and what will be the aspect of these materials once curcumin is added. In all these preparations, we maintain the ratio of curcumin to the metal to be 1 10 to the minus 3. By looking at these materials, the, the macroscopic uh, appearance of these materials shows that we have different colors, either for the materials without curcumin or with the curcumin. So how do we expect the curcumin to exist in these structures? This is the molecule, the curcumin molecule. So we expect that this material, because the preparation was done by mixing everything at the beginning, so before, so pre-gelation, we were expecting the, the, the curcumin to be widely and homogeneously distributed or dispersed within the network of the material. So the curcumin will be occupying or will be existing inside the pores of these materials. The question that we asked first, why do we have different colors for this material pre and post encapsulation? So the answer is that because we have different kinetics of the hydrolysis and condensation of the precursors. So we're starting from different inorganic precursors that each one of them shows a different kinetics in the, in the, for the hydrolysis and condensation. And accordingly, we'll have different sizes of the secondary particles. Also, we note that all gels are opaque. Specifically, once curcumin is added, the explanation is that the light scattering is the one that is responsible for this. Once the molecule exists in the network, in the inorganic network, this will affect the, the pore network and the size of these pores. Also, we noticed that once we soak our material in acetone, our gels in acetone, and after drying them, the material is not affected. So the curcumin inside the network is not affected and it remains within the network. This is the first observation we had. In order to understand or to make sure that curcumin exists um, in the network, we used the FTIR spectroscopy 
to monitor what's happening. Here I'm showing the, the, the uh, FTIR spectrum for pure curcumin. This spectrum shows some typical bands that can be attributed to the various um, functional groups within the curcumin molecule. For instance, this peak somewhere around 3,510 3, centimeter minus one is for the OH stretching vibration of the phenolic group. This broadband is attributed to the OH group in the enol form. Here we have the CHs, the stretching vibrations of the CHs. In this region, we have the carbonyl group. We have the symmetric aromatic ring stretching vibration around 1600. And around 1500, we have a mixture of these different vibrations. All of these are belonging to the curcumin. This first observation was important for us in order to see what happens post uh, encapsulation. And here are the, uh, the spectra obtained for the various materials we had after uh, encapsulation, after soaking in acetone, and after supercritical drying. So this is for the, for the aerogels made. And the similarity is very clear. Here we have the typical bands that are showing the presence or that are confirming the presence of the curcumin within our network. Specifically, the stretching vibration of the CHs here, the carbonyl group of the, of the, uh, um, of the curcumin molecule, and this peak around 1500, which is a mixture of different vibrations specifically for the curcumin. So this, the inorganic networks do not show these vibrations. This confirms the presence. Another technique, to confirm the presence and the encapsulation of the curcumin within our, our network was using the TGA, the thermogravimetric analysis. And always we compared, we took a reference to the curcumin molecule. So the curcumin shows a decrease of almost 55% of, of its weight once increasing the temperature between, the, between room temperature and around 520 degrees Celsius. Certainly, whenever we are talking about inorganic materials, we'll not see this type of decrease, this 50 or 55%. This is because what gets degraded by, by heating is the organic part. The inorganic is somehow stable. So the, the, the decrease in the or the weight loss observed for these materials is divided into two, two parts. The first one is the loss of weakly bonded water molecules, which are uh, absorbed on the surface of the aerogels. And the remaining part here is, is attributed to the loss of the organic moiety, which exists. Here I'm showing you some of these um, uh, TGA curves for, uh, for, for the aerogels. I'm not showing all of them. I took a, three different materials, the silicon-based, the titanium-based, and the dysprosium-based. And this shows also that even for these three, we have different weight losses that which are which explain the disparity in the curcumin binding uh, with the various aerogels. So this means that the curcumin does not have the same affinity to the various inorganic networks. The fluorescence uh, microscopy shows also that shows also the the, the 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 dispersion of the curcumin molecule within the network. So here we have. Uh, the a, a sample of our gel under white light excitation, and this is under excitation at 365 nanometers. And this shows that the fluorescing molecule is dispersed within the network. The scanning electron microscopy uh, confirmed the porosity of this material and also showed that um, a minor effect of the presence of the curcumin uh, in the network is seen pre and post uh, encapsulation. So here, for instance, I'm showing you uh, micrographs for silicon, dysprosium, titanium, cobalt, iron, oxides, before and after uh, curcumin. And this, these micrographs shows or show little difference between uh, the materials with or without curcumin. And here I'm showing you the various uh, or the, the broad range of materials that we tested whenever curcumin is present. So these micrographs show that the presence of the curcumin within the, the network makes the material to be slightly denser 
and reduces the porosity, but by not that much. And the material is still highly porous. In order to understand what happens for the network, we try to under to um, to uh, to understand to understand it from a perspective where we said, okay, fine. So we are in, we are putting the curcumin within the network. But what happens to this network pre and post gelation? So what happens to this material to this mixture pre and post gelation? So and we we first we wanted to understand how the curcumin, curcumin releases from the hybrid alcohol gels in acetone. When I say alcohol gels, these are the materials before being dried. Since I mentioned before that in um, soaking these, this material with acetone was important or was necessary for the drying step. We wanted to understand if any of the curcumin that exists in the network is released within uh, or is, is released within the acetone during the soaking step. For that reason, we soaked 100 milligrams of the hybrid alcohol gel in four milliliters of acetone for one day, under stirring, and then we separated them. We took the supernatant of uh, what, what we have, and we analyzed it. We, have, we analyzed it by UV visible absor um, absorption or UV visible spectroscopy. So here we have, or I'm showing you how the curcumin absorbs within this range. And we, we, we prepared a calibration curve, a clear calibration curve to understand how much is released. Here I'm showing you three different behaviors. This is for silicon, this is for titanium, and this is for neodymium. Great, what, what do we have here? If you look at this, we can see that the most important band or the, the largest absorption is seen here. And this is attributed to the electronic dipole allowed pi pi star excitation of the extended pi conjugation system in the curcumin. Okay. For the silicon, the band is exactly at the same wavelength as the pure curcumin. So this is what we have, what we collected after soaking it in, in acetone. And this is what we have whenever it was pure curcumin. So since we are at the same wavelength in the same region, so we have no problem. So we assume that the curcumin, the curcumin molecule was released from the silicon and the quantification shows that around 35% of the silicon that we included in the silica network was released out. This was for the silicon and the color that we have here for this supernatant is exactly the same as we have uh, as the one we have for pure silica, for pure curcumin. However, by looking at this titanium and the neodymium, the supernatants are of different color and the shape of the spectrum is not the same. So what's happening here at the level of the titanium and neodymium? To answer this, we have three different possibilities. So it's either that we have a complexation between the curcumin molecule and the metal, and this is specifically when a color was observed here, like the case of the titanium. So the complexation is the one responsible for the, uh, for the change in the color. Or in the case of neodymium, we have a completely different scenario, which is a strong interaction between the curcumin and the, mole and the molecule. And this makes the, uh, the curcumin to stay within the network and none of the curcumin was released in the network. So this shows a very strong interaction between the, 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 the curcumin molecule and the neodymium oxide molecule. Or if we don't have any, uh, any absorbance, the reason could be a quenching. And this was observed mainly whenever iron is present. So specifically for the iron oxide aerogels and for the cobalt iron oxide aerogel. By looking at this inset here, we can see that we have for the uh, neodymium a shift by around 25 or 20 nanometers. And this shift could be attributed to a, um, a transfer, to a charge transfer or a, a ligand to metal charge transfer. So from the curcumin to the metal. Also for this experiment, 
We wanted to understand how, if there is a release, and this release was seen for the silicon, we want to understand, is it really a simple release by diffusion laws? So we followed how the concentration was increasing over time, and we followed it over 72 hours. And here are, is a picture showing what or how the color changes over these 72 hours. And by plotting the release of the curcumin, so the concentration of the release curcumin versus the versus T half, we end up with a linear plot. So the release follows the Higuchi model, and this is based on a Fikin uh, diffusion equation. So this shows a perfect diffusion of the curcumin from the silicon network. After we did this, we wanted to understand what happens to the curcumin after drying after the supercritical drying what i showed you earlier was before now what happens after after the the, the, the drying the curcumin exists in the hybrid um, hybrid aerogel to get rid of the aerogel and understand what's happening for the curcumin we dissolved these aerogels in thf and this was as i said to confirm the retention of the curcumin within within the network it's important to mention that the silica and titania aerogels were not soluble in THF. However, all others were somehow soluble. By comparing the absorbance of the curcumin, of the pure curcumin, to the ones of the various aerogels, we noticed the formation of new peaks that were, one was around 360 nanometers, the other one was around 450 nanometers, and these were attributed to changes in the environment of the curcumin. So the, this, the first one. And the second one to a curcumin to metal charge transfer. We wanted to understand what happens or how do they compare, how the curcumin and metal interaction compares before gelation and after gelation. When I say before gelation, this is whenever we have the, the organic moiety, present with the precursors, but in the liquid state. After gelation, this is after the, the, uh, the formation of the network and also after the supercritical drying. To do that, we uh, used fluorescent spectroscopy to reveal any changes in the microenvironment of the, of the molecule. We excited the material at 425 nanometers and we collected the, uh, their fluorescence. The first thing we noticed is a change in the maximum for the, uh, for the curcumin. So this blue shift of around, uh, of around, from around 560 to around 500 nanometers is attributed either to change in the microenvironment of the curcumin up in encapsulation or to some condensation that takes place between the OH group of the inorganic precursors. Remember that the precursors, whenever they, they, they uh, or before making the network, they go through a hydrolysis step where, or which leads to the formation of OH groups. So these, some of these OH groups will remain on the surface of the material. And that's why it's possible for them to condense with the phenolic or the ortho methoxy groups of the curcumin. And this could be the reason for this blue shift seen here. If we look at the, uh, the, the material, the iron and or the iron-based aerogels, so iron and iron cobalt curcumin aerogels, we notice a decrease, an extension, an extension of the uh, fluorescence. And this is attributed to the quenching of what of the signal because of the iron present in the medium. If I go back to the material before gelation, what do we observe? We notice here the extension of the fluorescence whenever iron is present. The same thing like what we, what we observed after gelation. So this confirms the idea or the, the initial interpretation that the presence of iron within this type of material is the one responsible for the quenching. But also we noticed for, for, the, for, the, for the titania based a redshift and an increase in the intensity of the fluorescence uh, signal. What do we have this? This can be attributed to some change in the environment 
and specifically to a very weak interaction between the titanium and the uh, and the curcumin present. So this high solution confirms the absence of any quenching, as I said before, and the low intensity here after gelation is due to the presence of the curcumin in the material. This is for the, for the quenching for the iron, but what about the quenching for the titanium material? Something I, 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 um, I did not mention earlier that in order to make the titanium aerogel, the use of nitric acid was, in, was important. So we need to, to acidify the medium in order to, uh, to form the network. So the presence of the nitric acid is the one that is quenching or the, the one responsible for the change in the structure of the molecule and decreasing its, its uh, uh, fluorescence, uh, fluorescing property after gelation. However, before gelation, this was not seen because the measurement seen here was without or in the absence of any nitric acid. The reason if the, that we did not use nitric acid here is that once we add nitric acid, the hydrolysis and the condensation will be extremely fast, and it was impossible for us to measure anything later on. So the, the measurement in the presence of the nitric acid pre-gelation was in, impossible. At the end, we wanted to understand or to know if it's possible to recover the curcumin from this hybrid aerogel, from the hybrid aerogels. To do that, we returned back to the experiment where we uh, dissolved our aerogels in THF and wanted to understand their um, uh, behavior under fluorescence microscopy, uh, spectroscopy. For that reason, we measured after excitation at 425 uh, nanometers, and we found the following. So the, the band here, this um, intense band here, confirms the changes that takes place for the material after and during, during and after gelation, once uh, dissolved in the, in the THF. The broad band here observed for the niodinium shows that the THF weakens the interaction between the curcumin and the solid network. And this allows the curcumin to exist in the solvent in a free way, like if it was free uh, curcumin in the medium. And the very low uh, or almost negligible signal observed here is only for the materials that contain iron, like iron oxide aerogels and uh, iron cobalt aerogels in the presence of, of curcumin. And this is a, or a, an additional confirmation that uh, the presence of iron in the medium decreases or quenches all types of, of, uh, of fluorescence uh, signal and, and absorption. And the, uh, and the uh, interaction between the iron and the network is very strong. So to conclude, I can say that in this work, we confirmed or now we, we showed that it's possible to prepare hybrid curcumin metal aerogels, metal oxide aerogels, and we did it for the first time. We showed also that the fluorescence spectroscopy used um, was very helpful in revealing the strong interaction between the curcumin and the aerogel. And um, uh, this interaction is maintained after, uh, before and after the supercritical drying, except for the silicon material, silicon-based material. Also, we showed that the curcumin stability within the aerogel is confirmed with some micro changes in the environment of the, of the curcumin after encapsulation. And also we showed that the presence of iron in iron-based materials like iron oxide and cobalt iron oxide uh, curcumin aerogels cause complete extension of the fluorescence signal. Uh, at the end, I wanna uh, thank the people who contributed to this work. Uh, Dr. Wa Alhamd, who was the postdoctoral fellow who worked on this project and my colleague, Professor Digambara Patra, who uh, was a collaborator on this work. Also, I wanna thank the American University of Beirut for funding this work. And thank you all for attending and uh, for uh, organizing this very nice event. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Rashi, for your uh, excellent talk on uh, curcumin-loaded aerogels. And uh, we are very much thankful to you for sparing so much of your valuable time for us. And uh, uh, we will um, uh, encourage our students to interact with you uh, virtually with any questions or anything, because today we do not have time. And um, uh, we are very much thankful to you to hear from you. And hopefully we will meet again in uh, future. So this, uh, this is the end of our session today. And we are uh, not able to go for any question session right now. So we'll ask our students to contact you over mail. Thank you. And in Indian style, Manakkam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Participants, afternoon session will be held in GMeet. Please join the link at 1.45 p.m. Three sessions will be parallel. So please check your master chart and a specific link for the session, second A, second B, and second C. We are uh, taking a lunch break up to 1.45. Kindly join the links, respective links, after verifying your uh, numbers from the master list and uh, join 2A, 2B, or 2C. The links have already been given. In case of difficulty, kindly contact us. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening and making the session successful. Thanks a lot. <laughs>